Hey everybody, today Rado runs through his top 10 heavy board games. And this is going to require some heavy lifting on my part. Although, um, I'm only going to be talking about 10 today, but five years ago, I did this list back when I was living in Malta. And I figure enough time has passed that I should really revisit for you. And I am not going to be replacing my old list. That list still stands. I took a look at it again this morning, and I would stand by all of those as being amazing, fantastic, heavy games. So what I want to do today is tell you about 10 new ones. And so what I did is I went to my collection, I sorted it by weight based on the Board Game Geek rankings, and I'm going to be doing a countdown telling you how they get heavier and heavier but not based on me, based on Board Game Geek. And you may be surprised by some of these. I know I was. And so that'll be a really interesting journey for me to go on. And I hope you enjoy it too, if you like some heavy cardboard in your life. And speaking of heavy cardboard, what a segue. Uh, everybody say hello to Jess Cassidy. I'm right there or there. Yes. I'm not quite where, where I'm putting her. <laughs> hello. Hello, Jess. Jess, uh, for folks who don't know, um, by day, she is actually a marketing director in the uh, board gaming hobby. She has uh, oversees lots of Kickstarters for a lot of games you heard of. In fact, uh, Petricor is still live right now, right? Yes, it is. Yes. So you've got a few more days to check that out. Although Petricor is more of a midweight. I don't think that's going to be making either of our lists today. But if you go check it out, you will see some of uh, Jess's work. But that's her day job. By night, she is a media creator as well. She appears regularly on Heavy Cardboard, the premier um, you know, media channel for all things heavy in the board game universe. And uh, mm -hmm. in fact, she now has, it's a weekly show, right, Jess? Yes. Called Girls Stampede, um, right? That is right. Yes, and I have seen one episode, and it was great, and I'm looking forward to more. If you uh, hit the links down in the show notes, you will be able to go to a playlist. Um, and what's that about, Jess? It basically highlights women in the board game industry. We play a game and talk about their experiences in the hobby. Now, and it's not necessarily a heavy game for that show, right? No, not necessarily. Uh, a lot of this is thinky filler, um, but things that have kind of caught my attention or I wanted to highlight more, maybe smaller games from smaller publishers, or just things that are light, but you could play on your lunch hour um, and maybe introduce some more people to the hobby. Cool, cool. All right. Uh, well, I think that is fantastic. Um, and yeah, we are not going to talk about any lightweight lunchtime fillers today either, but Jess has got you covered six ways to Sunday yep. if you want to check it out. And I, and I strongly, I mean, I think Jess is definitely, what was it I saw you on Jess? Cause I contacted you. You were on another recent online event. Yes. Uh, for Gen Con online, I was on the panel for content creators as well. Yes. That was a fantastic panel. Um, with uh, it was uh, hosted by uh, Tiffany Ralph, the One Tar Rodney yes. was there. A bunch of people were there, yes. and and I gotta say, Jess really jumped out. I already knew her because I'd been seeing her on Heavy Cardboard. I even worked a little bit with her on some Kickstarters, but I when I saw her talking, I was like, you know what? I want to talk more to her. <laughs> and uh, and so I actually shifted my schedule around to say, hey, I'm gonna do heavy games this month. I bet that will will bring her in. Yeah, I will lure her in like you a did wild lure elephant. Lure me in with that. Yes. Yes. All right. <laughs> So that is the situation. So you have 10 as well. I told I you do. mine, which is I am literally doing a countdown based on Board Game Geek. I don't know how you've made your list. So my list is actually just my favorites. I thought about uh, every year I do my top 50 games, not by weight, but just top games that I love. And I looked at my list from 2019 and thought about if the top 20 of those games were sitting on my table right now, which ones would I want to play in order um, that mm. were the heavier of those? So that's how I made my list. Okay. Now I'm feeling kind of embarrassed because maybe that's what I should have done as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. Also, I just realized the whole time I've been looking at the camera and I recognize now I don't have to do that. I can actually look at my screen and look at you. Yes. So we can actually have a real conversation because <laughs> you've been looking at me the whole time. I have. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. All right, folks. Uh, if, if you ever check out the Heavy Cardboard channel in general, Jess's show and uh, everything else that she and Edward do, they are a level above me in terms of professionalism and quality. Jess has decided to slum it with me today, <laughs> and um, I really appreciate it. All right. Well, then, I think we're okay. Let me get my notepad up one more time. 
And there it is. And I am ready. Are you ready, Spaghetti? I am ready. Okay, then I'm going to start out with my number 10 on the list, which again, based on Board Game Geek weight rankings, is also almost the newest game on my list, Black Angel. Oh. Uh, yes, and I love Black Angel, which in case you don't know, is a kind of a the heir apparent, a sequel of sorts, or a spinoff from one of my favorite top 10 games of all time, Twa. And it was really interesting to me that Twa is not ranked anywhere near as heavy, according to the hive mind of Board Game Geek, as Black Angel. Now, really? that could impart, yes, mm -hmm. I think that might be in part because it's a newer game. And so fewer people have rated it. And, um, you know, it has a tendency to skew high. And I wouldn't be surprised if over the next couple of years, as uh, Black Angel becomes more widely available, maybe it skews down a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I thought when I made this list, I'm like, I don't care. I love Black Angel, and I'm happy to talk about it. And I assume you have played both, right, Jess? Black yes. Angel and Twa? Yeah. Um, both games, for folks who don't know, they are at heart dice drafting games. Where every round, everybody has some dice. Uh, we roll them, and those are my dice unless Jess wants them, because she can pay me to take them and then do various and sundry actions. Uh, you know, they're very point salad -y. There's lots of different threads you can be pulling on, lots of plates to be juggling. Twa is about a, um, I think, a pre-Renaissance era city we're trying to rebuild. Black Angel is about a far-flung future where an AI-controlled um, arc is flying through space trying to rebirth humanity on a new planet after we've all died out. Right. Grim stuff, but very cool. And um, at, the, at the heart, they both have the same thing. But would you agree, Jess? Because I do believe I agree with um, Board Game Geek that Black Angel is the heavier of the two. I would definitely say it's the heavier of the two. But as you said, maybe that has a little bit to do with I've played it less than Twa. So there's more to kind of explore and less that I'm familiar with. So that definitely could play a part in that because I wouldn't say it's tremendously heavier than Twa. Yeah. I'd have to go back and look. Maybe Twa's, um, actually, wait a minute. You know what I can do? <laughs> I can go back and look. I wasn't planning on going to this, but I have a list of everything. And Twa, if I was counting down to my number 35, Based again on board game geek weight mm -hmm. because it comes in at a uh, a three point six while today um, black uh, oh and I just lost it black angel sits at a three point eight so we're talking okay. you know yeah that's not bad that makes here. sense yeah and but I I I agree that it is heavier because it's unlike Twa which I think. I never would have thought of the Twa this way, that it's a it's a fairly coherent game. Black Angel is literally three or four games all jammed yes. into one box, almost kicking and screaming. <laughs> hey, let's have this uh, exploration game. Let's have this AI programming game. Let's have yeah. this dice drafting game. Let's have this worker placement game. Um, and it, it's got so much going on. But that is one of the reasons I love it so much. Uh, it did make one of my top games of last year when it came out. And uh, yeah, I, just talking about it now it makes me want to play it. Um, and that's my number 10, Black Angel. Nice. Yeah, that is definitely a good one. We talk about that one a lot here, um, having played it. And just the artwork on it, it's gorgeous. It, you want to play it just to look at it because it's so unique. Yes. Yeah, with uh, Ian O'Toole's art. Okay, we're not mm -hmm. done talking about this yet, folks. <laughs> I apologize, folks, if this ends up being a two-hour video. But this is just my opportunity to talk to Jess, and you're just along for the ride. I'm curious, Jess. Um, maybe both of these are in your, uh, your top 50 list you have at the handy. Which do you rate higher? Uh, for Twa and Black Angel? Yeah. Oh, I would rate Black Angel higher. Um, wow. Not, yeah. I'm not talking heaviness, but just in terms of what do I want to play today? Yes. yes. Why is that? Uh, just, I think because, you know, and this is where it gets into Cult of the New, because mm. it's new, because I've played Twa so many times. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's a lot more to explore in Black Angel, but I think across the board with the way that that was designed, that is going to be one of those games that is going to have a lot of replayability <clears throat> at the beginning because there is so much to explore. Like you said, there's all those mechanisms working yeah. together. And Twa has that, but not to the degree of Black Angel. Yeah. I, uh, of the two, uh, my overall rankings, I love Black Angel. I still rank Twa higher. Yeah. Because I would think it's almost an objective statement of fact that Black Angel is a superior design, um, you know, based on any number of metrics, because of everything it does, because of its ambition, uh, because of everything it pulls off, that it takes all these crazy disparate things and makes it into a solid game. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I find missing in Black Angel that I love from Twa is all the crazy, unique, powerful cards. 
that Fair. so radically changed the game. The, the you know there there's a similar system with uh, different planets you can explore in Black Angel yes, instead of different of bi yep. businesses you can run in Twa. Mm -hmm. Um and the Twa stuff it's like hey uh, be the best at running a parade. There's nothing like that. I mean, everything about Black Angel, I think because it's so big and so expansive, they kind of contracted themselves in the objective card system to make that a little bit simpler. Mm, that's true. Maybe there'll be an expansion for that. They yes, please. That <laughs> yes, Pearl Games. Make it happen. Yeah. Elaine and, uh, you know, and all the rest of them. I want that. I want that bad. That is a good idea. All right. All right. Well, what do you got for number 10? Well, so we went from talking about the art in Black Angel and how unique that is and how much was put into that. And my number 10 is going to be Food Chain Magnet. So we're going to go to the opposite spectrum. For <laughs> Here, I, I, I was suspecting you were going to talk about another Eono Tool game, perhaps. But no, you went in the completely opposite direction. Opposite direction. Because for me, art is beautiful and it can grab you and pull you into a game. But for me, it's the mechanisms. I want yeah. the gameplay to be that really unique thing that keeps pulling me back into the game. And Black Angel has that as well, so that's amazing. But Food Chain Magnet, it did not go for the art. Um, they did have an artist, contrary to popular opinion, that it's like all just like printer, you know, uh, pasted on there. That's yeah. they had an artist design this, and and I, I love like... the graphic design of the menu. Yes, uh, you know, I like and, and, how you know, it comes together. Yeah, just the board, just those tiles really are what let yes. it down, I think. Uh, maybe, but see, for me, you're yeah. starting your restaurant. It's thematic. You're starting your restaurant. You don't have anything. You're not going to be having enough money to put bling in your restaurant. So <laughs> you start out with this really basic look, and then you have to get, you know, you start investing in marketing. Okay, we talked about the fact I come from a marketing <laughs> background. So you got, you know, airplanes and banners that you can put up, billboards. I love that part of Food Chain Magnet. And then now with the ketchup mechanism, which I would definitely include uh, if I'm playing. I don't know what you're talking about there. What do you mean? The ketchup mechanism is an expansion. Oh, oh right. No, yeah. yes, yes, because it's an actually expansion. You're not talking about, uh, yes. The In, with it. Called, the ketchup yes. mechanism. It's ah. called, because they have such a good sense of humor. Yeah. Um, and there was always this thing about splatter games that designed Food Chain Magnet that you could get as I like to term it, splattered out, meaning, you know, oh. turn two, turn one even, you could make some decisions that were going to make it so there was yeah. no way you were winning yes. this yes, game. Yes, yes. So the catch-up mechanism was kind of a joke that, oh, now you can catch up. With I have to admit, I don't know what that is. I mean, in a nutshell, what have they done to address that? Because I remember they famously... <laughs> Oh, it's just they're trolling a joke. their customers. It's a little bit because I'm not <laughs> sure that in any way, maybe if you use it right, it mm. could. But it's called ketchup and it's spelt like ketchup, like Heinz yeah, yeah. or Hunts tomato yeah. sauce. This is not literally you're catching up in the game. It's the ketchup mechanism, adding ketchup to your restaurant. But you, it has a number of different options that you can use and there's kimchi that you could add in and your restaurant could have kimchi you could set up coffee little coffee stores and no matter what route somebody takes if they pass the coffee they have to stop and get coffee because of course they're going to stop and get coffee yeah. so you can you know supply people coffee on their way to other people's restaurants so maybe they're marketing but their marketing helps you so in a way you could use it to catch up but it's not literally a catch-up mechanism. Um, and I just love the different things that they uh, went with for adding to this. Um, and it's just, I mean, Food Chain Magnet probably would already be my number 10. But with catch-up mechanism, it just makes the replayability of it immense. And I don't yeah. mind being splattered out of the game. I have played this game and made mistakes in turn two where there was no way I was going to win. I was playing against your rune domen, so I mean, yeah. cut me a little bit of slack. Uh, you made um, the mistake in round two. When did you realize you'd made the mistake? Oh, immediately. immediately. Oh, immediately. Yes. Okay. As soon as your rune took his turn and yeah, I was like, okay, that's the game. There it is. <sighs> but it's, you know, and a thing that I will do for newer players playing this game, because I really like to bring newer players yeah, into yeah. heavier games. That's kind of my goal is to show them that and highlight how these can be enjoyable if you have the time to invest in them, because obviously they play longer. But 
when I'm showing it to somebody new, if they get splattered out and they're really having a terrible time with it, they don't feel like, oh, let's just see how well my restaurant can do. I don't care that I'm not going to win. If right. they feel like, yeah, this is the dead end and I'm not enjoying this, then, and I've talked to Yarun about this, that you allow them to shudder so they can close up their restaurant um, because that's what would happen in real life. So again, I like things that are thematic. So they'll shutter their restaurant and be able to walk away. And maybe if it's a game day, wow. play a game with somebody else. Um, Did you just reveal an official variant for the game? Uh, I mean, I don't know how official it is. Maybe I can get your room to allow it to be a girl stampede variant. <laughs> I think so. I think there's a lot of people out there uh, because I don't know if you, I, I started to mention this on the dice tower, Tom Vassell, had been pestered for a million years, it felt like, to play this game, and he was always resistant. Mm -hmm. And he eventually sat down and played it, and uh, he now recounts it as one of his most miserable experiences ever, not because of the game, right. but because he came in, I think, over 100 points behind the yes. leader. Yes. And, you know, so he got splattered. I think yes. that's a perfect way to put it. And, uh, you know, it soured him. And it's a real shame there wasn't... It's a shame you weren't at the table, because you yes. can say, you know, the game unofficially, although maybe it should officially support... Yeah. Uh, going out of business. Yeah. And I did, I did run it by him when I was, uh, playing a game with Yarun and he was like, yeah, that's fine. Like, why would that, cause it won't impact other players greatly mm -hmm. if you're really that far behind. So that's brilliant. Yeah. I expect to see a post on the variants <laughs> uh, forum of uh, Board Game Geek by the end of the week, because right. that's really awesome. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and, and it's a brilliant game. I've got one more thing to ask you about it though, because yeah. I think this re re reflects or reveals a bit more about you. Uh, the reason it wouldn't come a million miles away from my list, even though I love everything about it, I especially love the uh, pyramid. The employee pyramid is mm, so, yes. so sharp and so thematic. Um, but gosh, that is a mean game. Oh, that is, is a it, harsh, harsh game. Uh, is it though? It's business. I worked very, very hard to create this. And then you'll just come along and undercut me a little bit. And oh, I just got splattered. And you uh, can do it back, though. So there's yes! definitely so yeah. There, there can be an there can be an escalation of warfare. <laughs> that yes. is that is exactly the answer. Yeah. Um, so I would say that means that you are not adverse to a little bit of uh, hey, all's fair in love and war and business. Twice so. So that's a really good question, and I have a little bit of a longer answer to that. I am not averse to it if it is benefiting you in some way. That's gameplay. Right. So right. if you are making a move um, to get yourself some points or do something for your business or whatever it is in the game, then I have no problem with take that nature. However, okay. I do have a line and my line is I don't like blocking. Um, so I don't necessarily like uh, knocking down somebody's sandcastle just because. <clears throat> So mm -hmm. if you're already going to get points, and especially if it's going to be harmful to you. Right, um, right. And there are caveats to that. And what I mean by that is you, it could be something that it's a net positive of points. So maybe you lose two points, but you're actually going to take someone down by 10. So your net positive is eight. That's still benefiting you. So yeah. I definitely look at it, you know, very clearly. But if you're actually just doing it to hurt somebody or to take things um for example i played a game of roundhouse where okay. somebody just used one of their workers because you can get multiple workers in that yep. and they use one of their workers to just sit just in one of the it, yeah. spaces and not allow anybody else to use it that to me wasn't fair gameplay that felt like yeah dirty let me right? ask you the ultimate test then if you're playing Agricola mm -hmm. and you see I'm letting those sheep build up and you see I've got the cards that need them and yet round after round I keep letting them build up. Yep. At what point do you say, yeah, I yep. don't have a stove. I don't have any fences. I'm yep. just going to go get them and set them all off in the wild. Um, yeah, that would depend on who I'm playing with. And that may be something I do. Uh, yeah. Because again, there's a benefit there, right? And I can see what you're doing. And so, and that's the thing I think as a player, you should learn to watch for. Um, mm -hmm. It's, I've learned to watch for not getting an early lead in games because then everybody's going to kind of come at you. And if they have a choice wow. of who to take points from they're going to take points from you, right? They're going to go after the leader. So I might even temper what I'm doing to build up later uh, for a big move 
to keep my points low. That can have that disastrous brilliant. effects though. You can keep yourself low too long yeah, and yeah, then yeah. your opportunity passes you by and then you just lose. So, but there's a lot of, it's for me, it's about gameplay. And if you're doing something for gameplay, then I have no problem for it. Um, yeah, go ahead. Well then but... folks, if you ever play with Jess, remember she will set those sheep free. <laughs> I so will. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe she'll give you a friendly warning around early. Maybe, Maybe. if she likes you. I might, I might just eye them and be like, see, you got a lot of sheep there. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a shame if somebody were to open you the back door. You might want to do something about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was your number 10. Oh, my gosh, yes. we're going to be here a long time, folks. <laughs> um, but uh, Food Chain Magnet, right? Yes. Okay, number nine for me is Gloomhaven, Ooh. which I love two pieces and i'm definitely curious to hear what you think about it i mean actually i don't even feel like i need to talk about gloomhaven i've done so many videos for it and its spin-offs and its expansions i've done live plays with jen it is my number three highest ranked game of all time wow. and um it's interesting that it came in so because uh, this is something i talked about when i did my top 10 whenever it was five years ago uh, to me there are two ways that you can evaluate how heavy a game is mm -hmm. either how deep it is and how complex it is um, you know, because Go is an incredibly heavy game. Oh, true. Even though you could sum up all the rules in one paragraph, mm -hmm. uh, because it is deep. The richness of that simulation, there is so much potential, so much possibility. Every choice you make is so laden with consequence, even if the rules themselves are incredibly simple. And on the flip side, you can have a really heavy game because it's just crazy complex, because it's the opposite. There's a billion rules. And I do, I would say probably Gloomhaven, which is kind of counter to me. Uh, Jen and I, when we go for something heavy, we would much prefer it be on the lighter side, or the simpler side. Side, the more streamlined side and not be all about a billion and a half rules but i think um you know the actual depth of, of gloomhaven's gameplay is comparable to other dungeon crawls that are out there mm -hmm. but it is so elevated in terms of its weight by the incredible amount of complexity of the simulation uh, you know, there's so much stuff to consider uh yeah. you know and you know i mean you know, even though sometimes in some ways they have simpler rules because hey nothing blocks line aside except walls so that's nice some games get really persnickety about that. But yes. then on the other hand, let's give you the most complex pathfinding rules for AIs in, <laughs> in board game history yeah. while we're at it. And people um, engage in scholarly debates about how, um, you know, and they create puzzles and mind twisters about what would the monster do in this case. Um, I love Gloomhaven so much because at its heart, well, I love high fantasy and I love cooperation. Whenever I can get a game where my wife will cooperate with me, <laughs> that's a win. And, um, you know, even though it's a bit longer than we normally go for, it's a bit more complex than we normally go for. The core gameplay of every turn, I got to pick two cards. And these are multi-use cards. And multi-use cards are one of my favorite mechanisms of all time. Every mm -hmm. card I've got in my hand has four options. I got to pick two. And then you've got to pick two. But the brilliance of this game is Jess and I, we are, I keep looking at the camera. I need to look at you. I have freaking <laughs> habits here. Jess and I are simultaneously deciding in secret what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Almost, uh, you know, a little bit of the mind or something like that. We can talk vaguely and obliquely, but then we have to reveal and we hope that we're simpatico. That imperfect communication is what really puts it over the top for me um, and makes it my number three game of all time. And on this list, according to Board Game Geek's uh, weight rankings, and I think it's reasonable because it is such a complex game, uh, it's number nine, Gloomhaven. So I have never played Gloomhaven. Whoa. I know, I know, I know. What does um, that say about you? <laughs> really, what does it? So it's just one of those games that for my game group, while I can get things like 18XX and Twilight Imperium um, to the table easily, Gloomhaven yep. is not a thing I can get to the table easily. Uh, so beginning of this year, we had a plan um, with the game group to figure out how to play Gloomhaven and get it and, and not like how to play, but more how to get enough people to regularly come together to play it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, 2020 happened. A lot of plans changed. <laughs> a lot of plans changed. So because of that, we have not gotten it to the table. We're trying to actually make that a virtual option <clears throat> and see what we can do about that. Um, because I have Gloomhaven and they have Oh my Gloomhaven, gosh, it's just sitting there mocking you? Mm -hmm, it's sitting there mocking us. So hopefully that we can get it to the table. But yeah, I from what I've heard about it, from what I've seen about it, I think I would enjoy it. However, 
I will say multi-use cards, yay. Um, mm -hmm. Having to kind of work together, guessing what somebody else is going to do. I mean, the mind is um, the world's leader in plays. Yes. yes. Um, so these is that are true. Yes. The world's leader in plays. There's uh, Eric Martin is just behind me, but by a bunch. And then there's a guy in Italy who's third. And then, yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, you're saying you personally. Me personally. I'm Based I'm on tracking leader. on Board Game Geek yes. number of, 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 oh, my God. Yeah. I'm the world's leader. Folks, I had no idea. We have the world's foremost the world's expert leader. on the mind. Wow. It's true. Uh, I played it. Uh, a lot uh, and I was going to every con in the world that year so I yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. I introduced it to a lot of people and a lot of people who said it wasn't a game I wanted to make sure they understood what it could do so that type of mechanism I'm you all for this, this game. So, I know I really do need to play it but it's one of those ones you have to find people who will make that commitment to want to oh. play that one game over and over again. So yeah, if, if I ever make it to the Northeast, um, <laughs> uh, there is nothing else we'll be doing other okay. than playing. We'll just sit down and play. Gloom. I've seen record. people do that. And I know people who've spent a weekend just playing Gloomhaven and, and banged it out. So, yeah. Guilty. All right. <laughs> well, then you don't have much to say. What's your number nine? Uh, uh, so mine would be Acquire. Uh, and I talk oh, about this game no. a lot. It's a classic uh, been around a very long time and I just I still love it the way it is there's you know variations that have come out uh, after the fact and but still acquire as it is I think that's the game yeah that would be the game I own the most iterations of I kind of have a collection <laughs> going of all the different acquires um, one still in shrink the one with the really fancy plastic uh, pieces to come out that that's all multicolored and um, 80s looking so yeah so acquire I like the simplicity of it I like the investing in companies the mergers um, you know the way the board works yep I enjoy acquire a lot it's that is a perfect counterpoint because that's what I was just talking about a game could be heavy because it's deep mm -hmm. or because it's complex yes and acquire is a go for our age it is yeah um, I, it's a shame I wish there was a good way to play it two player but there's just not. No. At least, not, unless you, I don't know. Are you I the don't have a variant for plays of acquire? Acquire, no. no. <laughs> I mean, you've been busting out all kinds of stats here today, so maybe you're going to yeah. surprise me. But yeah. Um, yeah, it definitely, what is that? It's Sid Saxon, right? And it was, it it was, was designed back in the 60s. Yes. Um, and yet it has as much to say and inform designers today as any game that just came out, it, yep. as any of the latest hotness. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely brilliant game. Uh, sadly, a game you'll probably never see on my channel, but can they see it on Heavy Cardboard at some point? Yeah, we've played it. Yes, there, there are playthroughs go. of Require, um, and I would do it again in a heartbeat. It's just a great game to show people. It's something that people could, you know, it's the Monopoly killer. It's really what yes. I would play with my kids to show them those type of mechanisms and introduce them to company investments and mergers and how you can tank somebody's stock. And like, this is a great way to intro people um, to that side of the hobby. That is a good one. That, uh, yeah, that's why I'm glad you're here because you are definitely throwing out stuff that would not have made my list, but these are definitely games to talk about. Mm -hmm. Okay, then um, ready to move on to number eight. Um, actually, yeah. Can I go first for number eight? Because this ties into Acquire. Okay. This is a good segue. I, 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 I I'm, I'm very happy. <laughs> Take the reins. So I'm happy. This is your show now. Number eight is Chartered, which is basically a 3D version. They, you know, they always talk about like 4D chess or something, right? Okay. So this is a 3D version of Acquire. And Chartered, basically the, the designer loved acquire and wanted to come up with a new spin on it um and so that wasn't just big boss which is another uh take on acquire mm -hmm. so it kind of combines the elements of both and came up with the ability to build up on your you know different uh wow. companies that you have out there um and it also allowed flagships so you have these limited flags that you can put on a company when uh, your building on it and make that your kind of flagship company. And you just talk about Agricola with like, oh, maybe I'm going to let your sheep go. When you are <laughs> kind of waiting to build your flagship, you want it on the highest level. And when you're waiting to do that, somebody else may come in and make it their yeah. flagship. And you're yeah. like, no, that was going to be. Yeah. So there's very interesting um, interplay 
in Chartered, and that's one I just wish I got to the table more. I um, have to admit, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I've never heard of this. When did it come out? Who is it from? This came out a couple years ago, and uh, let me get the name of that company. Yeah. I assume I haven't heard of it because, again, it doesn't support two-player play. Since it's, uh, it it's actually does. Uh, wow. Yeah, Charter can play it two players, uh, and it's a short. It's 60 to 90 minutes. It's not a super long game. Um, and uh, wow. let's see. It's Jolly okay. Dutch. Okay, that's all very nice. I don't care about any of that now. Um, <laughs> based on your experience of it, yeah. how do you think it would fare as a two-player experience? Or do you know? Or have you... Are you, are you as surprised as me that it and says... I enjoy, no, I enjoyed a two-player. I think you... Really? Yeah, I think you should try it. It depends, though, because then there's the take that... Exactly. The flagship, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure yep. yeah. if it's Any completely up your Any shared alley. world builder is always... You know, sometimes yeah. we dig it. Sometimes we're like, oh, I'm honey. I, I just hate... I, I, I can't keep saying I'm sorry yeah. if I do this over and over again. I just... I can't... I don't want to feel bad anymore mm. about being the shark that eats all your stuff. I don't know what this says about you personally and me personally, because I'm all like, yeah, it's fine. That's how you play. But I mean, that was my yeah. intro into the hobby at four years old with my <sighs> aunts and uncles who were like, you know, this is how you play. And you can only play with us if you don't cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are learning all kinds of stuff about this today. <laughs> so that was your number eight, Chartered. Yeah. I will definitely have to go check that out. Like I said, it might be a bit too cutthroat for us, but I'm definitely intrigued. Yeah. Okay, well, I will mention my number eight now, if I if I may. If you may, yes. All right. Um, this is actually one, I, I when I first saw that it came up so high in the weight rankings from BGG, I was a bit hesitant, but especially when I take into account the expansion that recently came out, the Norwegians, mm -hmm. I think A Feast for Odin is definitely, uh, no toys about it, a heavy game. And it is one that my wife and I enjoy quite a bit. At its heart, it is just another worker placement, mm -hmm. um, you know, harvesting goods and converting them into points via various and sundry um, mechanisms game from Uwe Rosenberg. But I'm assuming it's the game that he was developing that gave him his obsession, it seems, with polyomino Tetris tile laying. And taking traditional worker placement stuff and getting more resources and got to feed your people and all that kind of stuff you expect from Agricolas and Lahavs and all the rest of it. But throwing in this whole separate game of, yeah, all the resources we're getting, we have to kind of bundle it all together and fit it as tightly as possible with these very complex polyomino shaped pieces uh, is really satisfying. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, we actually played the original one. I liked it so much, except my, both my wife and I were really kind of taken aback by the random chance that existed because of, uh, what was it, the weapon draws, you know, getting harpoons and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that to our taste, it didn't really sit well. And I remember, actually, the, one of the things that actually solidified that for me is when I watched a heavy cardboard playthrough. Really? And I saw that um, somebody decided, you know what, Uwe Rosenberg's rules are not good enough for us. <laughs> We're going to have a little display. So there is no random chance. Is that, that is right? The variant. That is the variant for that. Yeah, I mean, there's... and and that's a thing to bring up. Like, I totally believe in house rules. Um, yeah. And I know that there are definitely periods out there that say you got to play the game the way the game says to play. But, you know, we talked about how I'm all over the place in the industry. And having done development and worked with designers closely and done play testing, I can tell you, you know, most of the designers I've worked with would be like, no, use your house rules because... Yeah. They're coming up with these rules and the way that the game is working based on their playtesting, based on their game groups. Mm -hmm. That may not be. Sometimes it really comes down to a choice yeah. where they're looking at, okay, do we do it this way or do we do it this way? And it may be 50-50. Half the people who are playtesting it like it this way or half the people like it this way, and they just make a decision. So that doesn't mean that you shouldn't look at it and say, yeah, that doesn't work to me. I don't yeah. want that randomness. I want to see what's coming up so I can plan ahead. Do that. I am absolutely positive that Uwe Rosenberg and company considered the fact of, hey, maybe we should have three mm -hmm. weapons out on display and mm -hmm. put just a little bit more depth. Yep. And probably somebody said, yeah, but it slows the game down and people yes. crunch more and this already has too much crunch and we can streamline this. Yeah. Plus it adds a little bit of zest and zing, mm -hmm. which I think is actually how Uwe mentions it in the rule book. Hey, there's some randomness here, yes. but live a little, folks. It's fun to... Mm -hmm. to sometimes get completely screwed by a card draw that you, <laughs> everything about your entire industry is based on getting harpoons and five times in a row you don't draw harpoons. Yep. 
tough to be you. Um, sorry, that's me channeling my old feelings. But I should say, <laughs> the Norwegians expansion actually directly addressed that. And that's not true. in the way that you guys did it, but in a really brilliant way that I was very, very impressed by. Yeah. So it's it's always been a sharp game, and I'm so happy to say that with Norwegians, I don't have to use that crazy... Uh, off the wall variant that some people use, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, number eight, Feast for Odin, great game, very nice and heavy, really. And honestly, of all the games, I think for me and Jen, this hits our perfect sweet spot of, you know, uh, uh, not too heavy because a game can get go over the edge and like, you know, my wife often talks about how she loves to grind through her options, yeah, um, and she loves that grind until a game takes it too far and then it grinds her down. And she's like, okay, I'm not having fun anymore. There are too many things to consider here. I'm going to be stuck here for half an hour on this one turn. Yeah, can we go on to something else? And I think right. Feast for Odin has just the perfect blend for us of open sandbox. There's a lot of things you could do. There's a lot of options. But here are the things that are kind of nudging you and pushing you and sculpting that if you want to take advantage of, it will give you a direction. And, and we love it. Nine, number eight, A Feast for Odin. That's fair. Yeah. So my... Number seven. Oh, do we? Are we switching up or do we? Uh, I think we this? we have totally flipped the script. We here. flipped the script because yep. I'm going to go. This actually ties in. So okay. you're, you know, going into agriculture, going into yes. Feast for Odin. Um, yes. My number seven is civilization. So it begins with agriculture, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Ancient civilizations and okay. focusing on that, but then it kind of goes into the emergence of Rome. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and then goes from there. So it kind of takes a step up on that, like begin with agriculture, but prepare for leading nations of people over um, this map, right? I don't so... know how I feel about your uh, segue, but <laughs> I'll allow it. It's... <laughs> I mean, I love Feast for Odin. I really, truly do. As long as you introduce the sheeps by saying, bah, as they come out. Um, Another then... variant, but that's one I can get behind, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs> then you're fine there. Um, but yeah, so civilization. And this is one where we talked about Sid Saxon. You know, this is one where it introduced to gaming um, through Francis Tresham this whole new concept of, you know, tech trees and a whole new mechanism that really influenced where games went after that. So I think you can kind of see that I have a sentimental kind of uh, soft spot in my heart for games that really influenced our hobby wow. and, you know, pushed things in a new direction. And it's hard for this one to leave my top list because of that. It just, and again, it's one that I have a collection going of. I have the first iteration of Civilization, the unplayable one that's broken, um, <laughs> uh, that I, uh, the Sid Meier one, I actually have that in shrink. There's no reason to play it, but just as a collective standpoint, I wanted to have all the different versions of it. Um, so yeah. Including Mega Civ, I assume. Yes, and I do have Mega Civ as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So, okay, <laughs> that's really interesting. And that's interesting that that's your metric. It, I was going to say it's like nostalgia, but no, it's not really. It's more like reverence and respect. Yeah, I think so. And, and every time I see it in other games, I'm just like, wow. Like, And having, I did get to meet um, Francis Tresham when Edward did his interview with him. I got to okay. go as well and was kind of the grip handling the camera and the behind the scenes stuff. And he, oh, he's just a wonderful, wonderful human being and so humble because he was just like, oh, it was obvious. Like, how did you come up with tech trees? I mean, it was obvious. It was just obvious that this is how it was supposed to work, that no one had thought of before. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. This is how games should go. And that, to me, is just incredible that he was able to, yeah, discover something new in the world of gaming yeah. and create yeah. that. Yeah, it's a huge milestone, definitely. Mm -hmm. And it's milestone stats. I mean, because you, okay, okay I'm going to put you on the spot. Um <laughs> Putting that aside, yeah. you know, the, the reverence, you know, it's, it's milestone nature and all that. You would you, you just, hey, we're, we got a couple games to play. You want to yes. play Civilization or do you want to play Through the Ages? Uh, ooh, that is a really good question. Um, I like Nations better th than Through the Ages. We were separated at birth! <laughs> yes! I thought I was the only one! No. <laughs> okay, then I rescind my earlier one and say Nations or Civilization. I, I was just putting that out there. 
yeah. for the peanut gallery. But yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, oh my gosh, Nations is so amazing. Yes. But and anyway. this is a huge thing, um, especially with Edward, because Through the Ages is his, you know, one of his favorite games. And sure. I always say Nations is better. Um, he, but you are right. He is wrong. <laughs> see and he hasn't played with some of the things that you can add into nation so he he needs to sit down and do that we need to do that so he can discover that and we actually both uh met the designer of nations at oh goodness i think it was uh essen yes essen last year and he actually told us the story of how you know nations came from through the ages he actually yes. you know it wasn't it was directly, you know, something that he developed as actually a fix in his mind for the fact that you can just go full military and have to use military in mm -hmm, Through the Ages. Mm -hmm. So this was his fix for Through the Ages. And then the designer didn't want to go in that direction, even though he'd been in close contact. And he got permission to go ahead and release this as Nations. So, yes, Nations would be better for me. Um, nations and Civilization. Nope. I actually would play Civ over wow nations. okay then. if i All had right. the group to do it um yes. i think civ is a harder sell it's harder to get people to want to play it and i think it just has a stigma of oh civilization that's that old one that's really hard it really isn't um <laughs> and if you've played through the ages if you've played nations you should be able to play civilization i think it just kind of i think mega civ maybe even influences that kind of connotation of it because mega civ mm -hmm. yes i mean that's huge and you're gonna need to i've actually never played through an entire mega civ i've done okay. a group play at a con where we yeah. took turns basically because it's so much time and so it was like okay you're gonna take oh it was almost era. a play by mail kind of thing except just, we, you went oh, over, i'll be back in two hours and take yes, my turn kind of thing you you basically there was a sign up and you took times and then you oh my on. gosh wow it's actually that really is, cool it's an amazing way to cool. play it and the person who is before you sits down and says okay this is where we are this is where i was going secretly and like here's what you might want to do you know here's what i'm leading up to and it has this kind of group think of players um and it was it was a tremendous way to play the game so that is, that is phenomenal yeah. Uh, yeah i mean and, and talk about epic yeah mm -hmm. well okay that's a that is a great entry um <laughs> I was hoping we'd have more overlap, but apparently that is not the way this is going to go. But these, these are still amazing and fascinating. All right, so that was your number seven. Yes. Um, the OG Civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, my number seven is actually by far the newest game on the list by a few months. And again, I think it's here as a part of the, I talked about earlier, Board Game Geek rankings. Oh, there's a game. It's heavy. Everybody give it a five. <laughs> um, you know, because BGG's <laughs> ranking is on a scale of one to five. And it's, I mean, I suspect over time this will drop. Yeah. And which is really what made me think, you know, I really should be making my own list like I did five years ago. Uh, because honestly, I think Nations, which is not on my list, uh, because Nations is has been around long enough that it's kind of worked its way down. Uh, you know, it is quite a bit lower this. But still, my number seven, I love it to pieces, is my number one game of last year's Maracaibo. Mm. Yeah. Which I, I imagine you must have played. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, 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 now I'm suspect. If you haven't played Gloomhaven by now, but okay. <laughs> you have played Mar Maracaibo. Uh, Maracaibo, Maracaibo, I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. um, but... I would say this is heavy-ish. I would actually, I would almost go as far as to say this is maybe the lightest on my list, even though it comes okay. in at number seven. Um, but who cares? It is a great game. At its heart, it is a tale of swashbuckling privateer, or privateers in the uh, Mediterranean. Or no, I'm sorry, the Mediterranean, the Caribbean. I was in the Mediterranean. Um, basically, and the whole game is one gigantic rondelle. The heart of this game is every turn, I am going to move forward a certain number of steps. But unlike the laws of Mac Gertz, where you can only move three spaces... Now, unless you pay, um, <laughs> yeah. this one you can move up to seven. And mm -hmm. so it's like a, uh, a rondelle on speed. And every uh, port that you could go to gives you a lot of different opportunities. There are many different plates you can be spinning in this game. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Focusing on building your own empire, focusing on supporting the colonial powers of the age, uh, exploring the, the jungle, uh, lots of different things. And um, actually... What I love about it the most, although I don't think it really has anything to do with the weight, I am so appreciative, and I'm curious what you think, uh, Jess Cassidy, if you've played it enough, uh, the 
the intent, the attempt to integrate storytelling, a narrative that mm. you can play Maracaibo over and over and over again and have a cast of characters who, in a very simple way, you know, it's just a few paragraphs of text before you play every game where, oh, last time we left our heroes, this is what was happening. And now you're off doing this thing. And it and just introduces and changes rules slightly as you play through the campaign. I love it to pieces. And I look at that as a uh, blueprint for how narrative in the future can get wound in interesting and, as far as I'm concerned, compelling ways to heavy Euro-style games. And I love it to pieces. I don't know if it deserves to be here, but I didn't care because I love it so much. I'm just happy to talk about it every chance I get. My number seven, Maracaibo. I, I mean, I think that's fair, right? We get to kind of have our own take on these things. It's not just BGG stats or what they think is yeah. heavy, right? So that's fair. Uh, that is interesting, the way that it can interplay, and then you have this <clears throat> longevity. I mean, you just talked about Gloomhaven and how you like that long narrative. So yeah. I can see that. Um, it didn't make my list. Uh, I'll, I'll spoil it. It didn't make your 50? Uh, it didn't make my 50. <sighs> mm, I don't think it did. No Fister fangirls in the house, you're saying? Well, it was 2019. I know I wrote this. and it, It's possible that when I did my 50 list in 2019 that this wasn't out yet. Because I we'll do think it, it was time. later in the year. So I will caveat with it may have been that at the time I was doing this, this wasn't um, one that I could consider. So, but yeah, I mean, it's a highly rated game for a reason. It's yeah. one that's easily accessible for people. And I do love theme bleeding through a game. So this does have that uh, in spades. And so that I do love about it. Um, but it's not, I wouldn't say I have a lot of Fister on my top 50. So probably not a okay. huge Fister fangirl. But that doesn't mean it's not a great game. I don't tend to look at, you know, or consider designers when I'm looking at games. I know a lot of people will say, really excited about it because it's from this designer. That's not yeah. really where I go with it. I look at mechanisms. Oh. Okay. Um, All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. And what mechanisms I like tend to be what draw me to a game. So I'm not really, yeah, that's the, fr that's funny. That's actually a realization for me right there, like live, uh, that when a new game's coming out, I'm looking at what mechanisms it has. That's what I saw. The first by. thing you look at is not who designed it or no. who published it. The first nope. thing you look at is give me the list of mechanisms. Yes. Is it something that I'm going to enjoy? Is, um, am I going to enjoy how these mechanisms work? And then for reviews or people that are playing it, what I would ask people is, you know, so how's the theme? Is it, is the theme, you know, does it feel like it matches those mechanisms? Is it utilizing the mechanisms? Do you feel like you're kind of immersed in it? What's the experience like? So mechanisms yeah. to experience of the play um, are what I look at uh, and not really just kind of, you know, who designed it. Um, and that's how I cannot I, fault that at I, all. Yeah. And I think that opens up, um, you know, for it, it's a benefit to me, like when we go to Essen and there's so mm. many games on that list, right? And you could sort it by, well, I like this designer last time, so I might like them this time. But I feel like that's an, a little bit unfair because especially when designers are starting out, their first or second design doesn't tend to be their best work, right? Like mm -hmm. they, it takes time, just like with authors, like you're, it takes time to kind of build up and learn things from your audience as you put things out. So I don't think that for me is a fair thing because, you know, you could miss out on new titles that maybe this designer just hit something out of the park, or you could miss mm. out on their later titles because you didn't like what they did you know, the first or second time they put out a game. So I don't tend to do that. Well, yeah, I mean, like, uh, oh, gosh, one of my favorite games. Is it, was it uh, Kashgar, Merchant of Silk Road? It might not have been that. It might have been another one. But I remember there was a game that came out of nowhere. And mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. This is a first-time designer. Oh, no, he's not. He's been designing kids' games for years. Yes. You know, and it wasn't Kashgar. It was a different one. But um, yeah, I, I totally get what you're saying. Yes. By the way, folks, I should hasten to add, just in case people are wondering and scratching their head, um, the, the designer of this game is Alexander Pfister. Just so, um, yeah. because we kept talking about Pfister fangirls yes. earlier. What does <laughs> Alexander that mean? Pfister. We're talking about designer Alexander Pfister. <laughs> Alexander uh, the designer Pfister. of an acronym. And I'm certainly a Pfister fan boy. Speaking yeah. of which, I have, since you've been really good about mentioning designers, I forgot, I totally spaced and didn't mention Sebastian Dujardin, one of the three designers of Black Angel. Mm -hmm. I'm just realizing Sebastian may be the most passionate French board game designer out there. A uh, great guy. All, all three of them are great. So, um, yeah. Mayor Cable. I love it. And and you dig it, it sounds like. Yes. 
I did. All right. Good how, how, how do you think it rates on a heaviness scale? See, I would say that's a little towards medium, but... I am inclined to agree a bit. Yeah. But but here I am putting Chartered and Acquire on there, and people rate those the... as easy as well. But as you said, to me, those are go strategy level. Like, yes. So it seems really simple. Rules overhead is, is not... Go is really easy. Yes. Go is super easy, except it's the heaviest, most complex game in all of human history. That's exactly it. So exactly. I'm glad yeah. you mentioned that with those, because if you look up the BGG ratings for Acquire and Chartered, I didn't even do so because I was like, no, those are totally so strategic, but they're rated as a as a mid-weight, and I would not say that. Like, if you, you can just keep playing it and start seeing where the strategy comes in. Yeah. One more thing I should mention before we move on, um, uh, because... One thing about Maracaibo that was definitely brought up as an issue, uh, and, I, and I think with good reason, was the depiction of the subject matter. Uh, you know, there, there were some questionable choices that the developers made. And while I think on the whole, they were cognizant and they were aware and they were trying to do their best they could have done better. And um, the publisher and Alexander Fister have gone on record saying that they do recognize they've misstepped and that they do intend to do better. They are actually working on... Um, uh, expansion content, yay, for yeah. Maracaibo, and that it will be much more diversity focused, which is fantastic as well. Just just to put that out there, because it is a valid thing that I think, I hope the industry um, continues to grapple with and not ignore. And, and good on them for recognizing when the audience spoke up and said, hey, you could have handled this better. And they say, you're right. So yes. just figure I should mention that too. But that's it for number seven. And I think you're still in the driver's seat. So what's your number six? Uh, dominant species. Oh, that's heavy duty. That, I mean, but it's so simple. <laughs> <laughs> it is, though, I know. Um, so, yeah, and this one's rated really high. They're, they're starting to get up there with it. But it, you know, there's, uh, Edward actually did a great teach for this. He's played this game probably more than any other, um, one of his favorites. And mm -hmm. so the teach for this really breaks down how it can be simple if you really understand the concepts. Mm. Um, okay. And, you know, it's another one of those games where, and this is by Chad Jensen, but it <clears throat> gives you so many options of what to do. And I'm always the insects because I'm green player. Um, and I like that a lot because the insects, <laughs> the insects get some little benefits and then they're just prolific. So you can get yes. all over the board. And I just, yeah, I adore this game. I adore all the pieces of it, how the game board can change, how players, and it, you know, there's take that and this, your place. There is a, I was going to say, there's a little bit. Little, a little, little. Like, oh, I mean, it's, it's the circle of life, right? It so, is. It's yeah, thematically yeah. appropriate cutthroatedness. It is. Because it, it is, is literally insect eat dinosaur it, in that game. It, it can be. It can yeah. be. We, we, we have our ways. Um, <laughs> but that's the thing. For me, this is it's very well balanced in that everybody has the ability yeah. to, to do that. So you're not going to be, you know, sitting there saying, oh, they're just, I'm an insect. They're eating me. They're stomping on me. It's over. Um, it's not. And so, yeah. Dominant species just opens up all these different mechanics that you don't necessarily usually see together. This great worker placement, these, you know, explore the board, the way the tiles come out, um, picking those tiles, uh, maybe having to jump on that when you had a plan to do mm -hmm. something else, but then great tiles come out and you need to get those out for your species to thrive. Um, yeah. And then obviously people getting there before you. Uh, yeah. and blocking you but there's ways to turn the tables on that as well there's Always. again all these options that you can take um so maybe if you get blocked out of one thing you take something else it's yeah and again that mechanisms and the theme bleeding through it it's absolutely one of my top oh yeah prehistory comes alive in a big way and it is mm -hmm. it is so tragic that we've lost chad jensen and uh, you know considering what a masterpiece this is and, and the same for urban sprawl as well that we will not mm -hmm. get any more um, but I mean, it's a hell of a legacy too that, you know, he's left that game behind and it's so amazing. And I mean, oh, that game's going to be play being played a hundred years from now, as yes. much as it is today, is it's that good. Mm -hmm. I have one question for you though. Yes. Um, because if I had one complaint aside from the obvious, oh, okay, this is way too cutthroat for me and Jen, obviously, mm -hmm. um, uh, we, one of the issues for us was dominant species and urban sprawl even more so mm -hmm. was the amount of upkeep. The constant, oh, well, because of this, all of these things have to change. Let's move all the cubes and this and that and the other. Is that ever been an issue for you no um but i will give the caveat that i have an amazing game group um ah. and 
<laughs> I get really spoiled. So I go to a lot of conventions as well when conventions uh -huh. are happening. And I have to remember I'm not with my game group when these conventions happen because we really take it everybody takes on the role of doing certain things and checking divide and conquer mm -hmm. exactly so there's a lot of but we're playing a lot of heavier games so i think when you have when that's your wheelhouse uh your game group starts to realize okay this is going to go a lot smoother and a lot faster if somebody's in charge of this if somebody's in charge of this part yeah, if somebody yeah, yeah, looks yeah, yeah. out for this so even when we're beginning to play a game we might be like, okay, your job is this. You take care of this. If you could grab this for me. Um, and that might switch up during the game. Like when somebody's, you know, if the, uh, uh, what do you call it? The point track is around the outside, around the outside. Um, then you might, you know, I might take control when it's on my side, them on their side. Whatever it is to make it easier for other players, we tend to jump in and do. Um, so my suggestion for a game like this is yes. really in the teach or in the beginning setup or refresher that you're doing for your game group, assign roles. Say when wow, this happens. That's, that is really interesting. It never this. occurred to me. Yeah. I mean, to be fair though, that's not going to work because all the roles will be assigned to me. <laughs> um, and so maybe that maybe I'm reflecting on that because I've got to do all the heavy lifting in addition to trying to play the game and I'm playing at all times with my wife against a total shark right who I mean I have to I, you know, I have to bring my a game to try to match her C game quite yeah. frankly I and mean, on top of that I'm also Jen, sure. I would I would have her do some things hey your jobs watch out for these when this happens flip these over that's going to be on you uh, honestly i think it helps cement the game for people too to that's have a good point yes rules um that, that they're is in charge very of. very true it's interesting you know that's something i know a lot of people getting back to gloomhaven yeah. are very very excited about the explosion of digital helper apps for gloomhaven mm -hmm. that will keep track of a lot of stuff and simplify right. and streamline a lot of stuff i've tried them and i never really find that no matter how well they're implemented i don't care for them because it feels like it becomes a barrier between me and the game yes you know no, that's absolutely true. And that's why I really do say, like, even switch it up. I think you're not going to get the real understanding yeah. of the game if you're not paying attention to some of those pieces and have that role. And that's the thing with my game group. The idea of splitting that is much easier for me than if I learn. And, and mm. again, another realize I'm getting all these realizations while we're talking. Radha. Well, and this is great advice, too. I mean, you are really making me rethink Jen's and my dynamic. I mean, we just yeah. played Marvel Champions yesterday. And at the end, she said, boy, I really love that. But, oh, I would have hated it if I had to be responsible for maintaining all the villains. And it's like, well, it's not that hard. No, it's just, it's just it just looks daunting because it, it's a lot of stuff. But yes, but if you yeah, split maybe. it up and then I really do oh. think you get it, it removes that barrier from the game. And I was going to say, I learned games at cons and I'll always say, oh, I don't know that game. I learned it at a con. So mm. I don't have experience mm -hmm. with it. So I always discount that. And I think that's because usually at a convention, there's a teacher. Either it's a demo that I'm being taught yes. or the publisher's teaching or the designer and they're running everything. And so, like you said, you feel that removal from the game where I don't feel like I understood it fully because I wasn't responsible for those pieces. And I think if you're really trying to do an immersive teach, having people be responsible for that can help them get what's going on and how their moves are going to impact you have given me cause to rethink how we play games here, <laughs> which is not something I was expecting when I said, hey, you want to do a top 10 together? <laughs> nice. Do you do marriage counseling next? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Super good at that. No. All right. Excellent. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we'll, we'll, take, we'll save that for after. Yes. Um, <laughs> right. So anyway, that was, that was um, your number six. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Your number six, uh, Dominant Species. I think, I, I feel like I should come up with a fantastic segue because my number six is Spirit Island. Oh. That is. That actually is a segue. Isn't it? They're yes. both just big islands. <laughs> They're big And islands. it's all about area control. It is. It's just Your Spirit is Island is is almost cooperative dominant species. Almost. <laughs> and and it's brilliant. It's so amazing. Um, and by the way, I should say, folks, prior to now, some of these entries, I thought, well, I don't know if this really warrants everything from this point on in my heavy list, I say deserves to be. And Spirit Island, um, I don't know if it is the heaviest cooperative game on the market. No, I can't, I can't say that definitively. <laughs> mm, what's that? Pax Emancipation. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. The uh, the heaviest non um, uh, you know Eckland title on the market or Eckland adjacent. Uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, yeah, there, there's a whole world of stuff out there that I just completely I just go cross-eyed even thinking about. Mm -hmm. Oh man, when I tried to do my run through of High Frontier. 
Oh. I still wake up in the middle of the night in cold sweats thinking about that one. That was tough. So, <laughs> although I really do want, I mean, Edward so convinced me to try the most recent packs, the the transhumanity or something like that. Oh, so good. So good. I might break my rule and go back into nope. the Eklund waters one I more have time. An, I have advice for you. If you yes. want to get into the packs, what, um, and this, I'm going to put my marketing hat on, but this is really pertinent to you right now. Okay. Um, so what they're doing is they're actually trying to break that barrier to entry for packs. Oh, because they are aware. Yes, they are very, yeah. very aware. Phil so says they can read my engineering manual and they'll like it. They'll love it. But everybody else <laughs> saying, um, dad, maybe. Yeah. maybe. Maybe make it a little easier. Yeah. But where I would have you start is Pax Viking. Um, which just which one, finished Viking? on, yes, Pax Viking okay. just finished on Kickstarter. Um, it was actually, uh, Yoon is the designer for that one, oh, but okay. you're going to want to take a look at that one. It's on tabletop, uh, simulator right now. And mm -hmm. then of course it's being released right later this year. It is the entry level for it. And the ad idea is to give you stepping stones into packs to give you the concepts and the mechanisms in a simpler way, teach mm -hmm. you those. And then I would absolutely recommend you go to transhumanity next. But if you can start at packs Viking, it'll really start to make you comfortable with how a packs game is going to have that ever changing okay. game state um, and then move up to uh pax transhumanity that would be a really good way to enter the okay. hobby and that's what they're trying to do um that's a conscious choice they're making conscious choice and also yeah. they've brought on a rules editor who may or may not be me um to edit their rule books so the rule books will not be uh huge uh <laughs> as they were <laughs> yes yeah um yeah when you get into section 4.3.1 <laughs> There's no four point. There's no points anymore. Excellent. No, excellent. Do yes. <laughs> um, well done. Well done, you. But now back to my number six, yes. Spirit that Island. Spirit. Although that was a very nice. I very much enjoyed that. Uh, <laughs> that that segue. Uh, yeah, it is a cooperative area control game. It is basically Settlers of Catan. If Catan were a had spirits of earth and wind and fire and air and players controlled those spirits and tried to get the settlers gone because the mm -hmm. settlers are the bad guys it's brilliant and i think the thing and maybe this is true for the paxes and 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 other stuff that's a bit you know outside of my wheelhouse at this point anyway the thing that really strikes me that makes spirit so heavy and this is something i very rarely see in co in pure cooperative games is the fact that it is simultaneous play it mm -hmm. is not a pandemic-esque, I'll go, then you'll go, then you'll go, True. then you'll go, and we'll just round table forever. And a lot of the challenge comes from, oh, if only you could go right now, Jess, you'd be able to do it. But we have to kill three turns before we give us your turn, you know. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the fact that Spirit Island, within a structure, there is a, we're in this phase, and then we're in this phase. Mm -hmm. But we're in a given phase. Do whatever you want. Do it in any order you want. Right. And that gives so much freedom and so much flexibility, and it gives the players control and the opportunity to be creative, creative problem solvers. Um, there is still a structure that gives you an overall arc, um, you know, and the game escalates and ramps up. Um, and if I had one complaint, it is a bit on the long side. I would love to see an express version. Uh, folks, is there an express version? Maybe I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But that freedom it offers you is something that I find myself wanting more and more desperately. Why don't cooperative games let players just do everything simultaneously? I know the answer because it introduces chaos. It because does, yeah. that depth then of, oh, well, we could do this spot. We could do, we could get, we could harvest those two grapes in 50 different ways. Yes. Right, let's walk through how we could do all 50 ways of harvesting those two grapes, as opposed to, well, no, if we have to do it in order, then this is the obvious way to do it. But, so it, it can be a dangerous thing, but I think Skir Spirit Island skirts that. Um, and it has really smart card play, too. A you know, different then, but in the same wheelhouse as Gloomhaven. And it's just, it's a brilliant game. And it's my number six. So I can appreciate that. Okay. Um, but I'll tell you a quick story. So I uh -oh. got Spirit Island with its first release when it first came out and sold out super quickly because yes. a lot of people agree with you that it has amazing gameplay. I, however, do not enjoy Spirit Island. So I played it once, a friend's copy, and was like, yeah, this is just not to me. I can see it. I appreciate okay. the game. Uh -huh. Not a game I personally enjoy playing. And so because of that, I ended up giving it to a raffle to mm. uh, 
uh, actually at the gathering of friends, they have a raffle. You're supposed to bring something kind of hard to find or prestigious. And so I had um, the base game and the expansion that wasn't out yet in shrink. Oh, wow. And I was like, here. And they were super psyched because they're like, no one can get this. And yeah. I was like, yeah, I have it. And I, I ended up getting um the in shrink acquire i mentioned with the <laughs> amazing bits so i was incredibly happy that i had made the trade to the you know uh well and you made, made some other people very happy too yes and i made somebody else very very happy with the with can the you articulate experience. can you articulate what it is that i mean okay you can appreciate mm -hmm. it intellectually it just doesn't yes. click for you in terms of fun factor yes now one thing i've noticed so far you are 0 for 2 on co-ops in this list yes are you anti-co-op I am. Um, there we go, folks. That's yes. kind of what I suspected. Mostly, I don't like cooperative games. Uh, I like strategy of decision making, which is a term I'm stealing from Edward because um, that's okay. why he got into board gaming. But that is definitely something I like. I want to see the decision. Even if I don't win, I want to see what decisions influence what in the game and see what is the ultimately best mm -hmm. way to play. But That's, you want to do it on your own. And I mean, yes, uh, because I feel like when we're doing it as a group, I'm going to be super cognizant of making sure everybody's heard, making sure everybody's oh, see. decisions are put into play. And I might even, um, my brain tends to like super calculate. Uh -huh. And, you know, so I'm like, if we do this, our end score will be 220. If we do this, our end score is 210. Like literally I'm playing. That's my wife. Game yep. That's I'll constantly. See. Yeah. But I don't want to do that to people, right? If I'm cooperatively playing, I don't want to make it about math and be like, no, we shouldn't make that move because in two moves, that's going to have a detriment and then we'll end up this many points down. Like, that's not fun for anybody. So m the way my brain works doesn't tend to be optimal for a cooperative play. Oh, I, okay, yeah. Then I'm kind of directing the play and I don't So you are do that. aware that um, an ideal cooperative experience for you is where you say, okay, everybody, I'm the alpha gamer. I'll be the quarterback. Yeah. If you guys would just sit and move my pieces around for me, that'd be great. <laughs> I really do try not to do that. And that's the thing. And, and, and you recognize that in yourself. Yes. It's so happening you... in my brain. I won't yeah. tell you. Like, I, that I don't do that. So, because <laughs> I don't want to be this that video? person. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Is it happening now? No. <laughs> okay. Oh, I can see your end game now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that works well for competitive and it doesn't work that well for cooperative. So exactly, I'm not going to necessarily enjoy those. Now there's games like I mentioned Pax Emancipation where it's actually some, it turns to solo play. So you begin cooperatively, but my brain can have its outlet of kind of looking at, okay, we're gonna cooperative play to this point and then I'm gonna t run with it here. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll work cooperatively. And I like that brain puzzle of wanting every, needing everybody to do well or we're going to lose. And then it kind of yeah. switches to a solo play and somebody wins. So that type of element of Pax Emancipation is really good for me. Um, Spirit Island, I love watching people play that game. I've seen my friends really enjoy that game and get into it. It just is something where my brain doesn't immerse in it. So yeah. I feel like I'm kind of out of the game, um, even when I'm playing with others. I just don't feel a part of it because I'm pulling myself back so much um, because I'm trying to make it competitive, even against the game. And So what they need to, to do is come out with the Settlers expansion where you can actually play as the French or the British or the right. Spaniards. And yeah. um, and then and then. Then You'll maybe. All right, all right. Well, even Robinson I, I'm Crusoe. I'm actually thinking right? about why hasn't that happened yet, or maybe it already has by now. I'm not well, sure. Well, but I think it, it because they did so well with what they did, right? Yeah. I think yeah. that would turn it on its head in a way that maybe people don't want. Um, the way that it is, people really, really enjoy it. Just not me. That's not a game I'm going to love. Um, but yeah, there. Robinson Crusoe is such a difficult co-op. Yes. That. That I actually enjoy because I'm trying so hard just to make sure we survive mm. <laughs> because it's so hard to survive. That the real you can come out and you yes. don't mind because right. you and they need want the real me to. to survive. Yeah. Yes. And everybody's kind of at that. No, we need the optimal or we're not going to make it. And so that one allows me to be more comfortable in that space. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I haven't played that in years, but that was one that I enjoyed when I did play it. And then a new one that's out that's co-op is um, The Night Cage, which I just played last week. 
on Girl Stampede, and that one is cooperative, but in a way that you, there's not that quarterbacking. Everybody has to yeah. make their move, and there's enough randomness that there's no way to predict what yeah. the right move is. It's a gut feeling, and you just have to kind of go with your gut and do what's right. And so that's another co-op. But you're right. It's a very small list of co-ops for me. Well, it's interesting. Um, it, it, it What popped in my head, that's why the mind works for you so much. Yes. Because you have to shut up. Yes. You are not allowed to talk nope. and tell everybody what to do. No. Nope. Um, that, that's the very nature, which is why I think Gloomhaven would be a good fit for you as well. Yeah. Um, because so much of that game is, look, I, we can talk broadly about what we're going to do, and I'd really like you to be over here, but you'd have to go really fast, because if you can get to this space really, really quickly, then I can do a really good thing. Yes. And then, okay, I'll try to do that, but then it turns out, you know, because we couldn't, um, you know, because the game literally won't allow you to run roughshod all over mm -hmm. everybody um and it actually because it's interesting you are allowed in gloomhaven there are rules there's a rules variant in the book saying hey if you want you can have total open communication play this like you would any other co-op if you're going to do that you have to bump up the difficulty level because the okay. game becomes significantly easier right. because it is a genuine challenge to get into the mind of your opponent and understand especially because the game tempts you to do things that are not um good for your party because you have secret objectives that you're not allowed to tell yes. anybody but you still have really cool stuff uh, and, you've convinced uh, me, and I, I now want to play Goomhaven. Yeah, yes, yes. Well, it, it will happen, and then we'll play some Acquire afterwards. All right. <laughs> All right. So anyway, that was uh, my number six, Spirit Island, mm -hmm. where you're still in the uh, uh, the Top Gun position. What's your number five? Uh, Brass Birmingham. Sure. Definitely. Brass was on my list when I did this originally, by okay. the way. So Fair. it would be on my list again. Okay. Uh, yeah, Brass Birmingham really upped Brass for me because, um, of course, there's Brass and then Brass Lancashire. And I was and, just going to say, yes, you said Birmingham, not Lancashire. Not Lancashire, no. Mm -hmm. um, Birmingham really upped it for me with the beer and with the, you know, things that you, again, there's a little the take that. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you can take. I, I have never looked at it as take that. I mean, um, or, you know, the, the, the Brass games are, to me, it is all about symbiosis. I'm actually building stuff so that you will piggyback off sometimes, me. Sometimes, so but sometimes you really needed that cold that you put out two turns ago, and why did you take it? I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, note to self, don't play brass. <laughs> yes, and, and, you know, but rightly so, they can look back at you and say, I flipped your tile, though. It, yes, yeah, thanks. This is a big, it, it, it's thanks. a win-win. The yes. game is literally winning. We're both winning now. Yes, and that's that's how they spin it. But, you know, there's <laughs> things you wanted to do. I had big plans, huge, amazing yep, yep. plans. So Brass Birmingham is, uh, from the second it came out, I mean, I saw it um, when they were still playtesting it, and they just did such a good job. And, again, it comes back to everything I love in a game, right? This has yep. the history of Brass, which, you know, was a feat in itself. And then mm -hmm. taking it to the next level with Birmingham, I just think um, Roxley Games did an amazing job with that and really added some tremendous things to it. Um, so much so that that was actually, I'll give you insight, that was the reason I got a tattoo. Um, oh, wow. Yes. I'm going to have to make the window bigger. Yeah. That wrist. <laughs> Can you see? Yes. Okay. So yeah. This yeah. This isn't. This isn't a brass tattoo. This has to do with my childhood, and it has to do. Um, I worked at Maple Games for a while. It really has to do with my childhood, but it tied in. Um, but when I met um Matt, who was one of the designers of Bra Brass Birmingham at mm -hmm. the Gathering of Friends, he had just gotten an amazing tattoo of um one of the machinery of Brass Birmingham on his arm. And it was because oh, it was wow. such a labor of love for him. And he had just, he felt like, you know, blood, sweat, and tears in the game. He had just gotten that tattoo. And I was like, I need it. I'm going to need a tattoo now. So he, he wow. inspired me for that. So every time I see it, I think of that. And I think of Matt. But this, this game, again, it just, it's immersive. It brings you, you know, the map is real. It change it the, the history game. is real the history yeah. is real the gameplay changes when you're going from canals to rail and how everything switches up and i just love learning about that period of history and experiencing it in the gameplay so yeah. you know we're talking about the mechanisms that i love and then bleeding that through with an amazing historical theme yeah brass birmingham's fantastic lancashire versus birmingham uh, for folks who don't know, uh, Brass Lancashire is what was originally called Brass. Um, yes. And it you know, got a big lavish reprint, and they came out with... You can have something almost the same as the original rules with Lancashire, or you can yes. have this other thing where we've added about an additional 20%, but we removed 5% yes. kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And and so you take Birmingham over Lancashire because 
it is a bigger, richer simulation with more stuff going on. And I like what was added and I like what was taken away. I like the ability, you know, the wild that you can do because sometimes you get stuck with the card play. So the things that they did in Birmingham, I really uh, enjoy. Yeah, I think it yep. makes it a better experience for me. Um, but that said, Lancashire, if if somebody we didn't have Birmingham or they just wanted to play Lancashire again, definitely a game I would play. All right. Yeah. And I mean, like I said, it was on my list. Actually, I just looked while you were talking. It would, um, uh, if, if I were including it in all my stuff today, if I was just like refreshing my old list, it would have been my number 11. And yeah. I think the last time it was number six, because I still think it's a phenomenal game. Really? So brilliant. So simple. J just, just play the card for the, you know, you know it's simple hand management so stuff. Easy. So rich. Yeah. <laughs> really, really. I mean, I mean, it's Martin Wallace's masterpiece. And yes. It's tough when everybody can identify your masterpiece because, hey, I'm still making games here. Yes. Um, and you're still doing great games, Martin, wherever you are. Yeah, he, has, yeah, he has a lot of great games in his catalog. Yeah, he's, yep, he's yep, doing yep. well. Yep. Okay, number five, Brass Birmingham, mm -hmm. not Lancashire. None of that garbage. <laughs> hey, I still like it. Still okay. <laughs> All right, my number five is Anachrony from mm -hmm. Tricarian Studios. Nice. And designer Dave Turchi. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sure you're, you know it. I yes. <laughs> yes. Here's the crazy thing about this game. I actually played Anachrony years before it came out. Uh, Dave, who is a friend of mine, um, uh, was showing me a prototype of a game. I believe at that point the name of the game was um, Time Factory, because okay. it yes. was an incredibly simple little gem of a game where we are all scientists that work in a factory that manipulates time, mm -hmm. and it was just about effectively a thematic way of saying loans. Um, because at some point in the future, we will generate a time machine. That's what we're doing right now. We're building time machines. We haven't figured it out yet. When we figure it out later, we will send the stuff back to us so that we can build it now. Yes. And that's just a crazy sci-fi, um, you know, recursive loop way of doing loans in a game. And I thought it was so clever and so fun. And then cut to three years later and I see, oh yeah, we finally, we renamed it to Anachrony and it has exploded into one of the most table hogging, um, everything <laughs> yes. in the kitchen thing thrown into the game. I talked earlier about, um, you know, depth versus complexity. And, you know, this game might have at one point been deep, but it has had so many layer upon layer upon layer thrown into it. Because yeah. this is what Mind Clash's MO. This is what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, they are known for, yeah. Uh, you want mechanisms? We got mechanisms. We got all the mechanisms. Yes. Um, and it's great. I mean, I, I, it's what it ultimately becomes is a worker placement game with very cool ideas of, uh, you know, we're in a post-apocalypse future. Uh, my worker is particularly good at a thing, but for him to do the thing he's really good at, he's got to travel to the main city, which means I got to put him in a mech, which means I got to charge that mech up. But I have to, you know, all this yes. stuff you have to do for what we, another game would just be, and what originally was, just very simple, oh, I'll do these actions, become this very thematically grounded and driven series of events. And what I think makes the game stand out one of my favorite games of all time, and my wife's favorite games, is Agricola. And one of the things we love most about Agricola is not the worker placement, but the fact that before you start playing, you spend 20 minutes with 14 cards to planning out your entire game. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, you know, because you know, oh, these are the cards. I'm, I'm going to play this one. I'm going to play this one. And then this one's going to come in late and all that. Anachrony almost kind of does that on a round to round basis. Because before we do anything, right, I got a plan. I, am I going to make it? If, if I actually power up this mech and juice it up and get this guy into it, is he even actually going to be able to make yes. it to the capital city yeah. so that I can do what I did all, you know, and, and that, all those level upon level and, you know, it's I get it's not a tactical game, but it's a it's a mini strategy game where every round is like a whole little miniature game in and of itself that you have to strategize and then see if it works out and then you start again, um, and it's it's very very cool. Uh, and uh, oh and if there's one complaint about the original game that you know well where's the time travel? It really is just alone. The expansions they've done have really pushed the time travel elements in a significant way with blinking and whatnot. Um, so yeah, it's very very impressive. And I'm curious what you think. I love Anachrony. I do think this is uh, one of the games where the expansions really did add to the gameplay. But I find that a lot with David Turtsey's games that, you know, he doesn't do expansions to just add in, you know, more flavor or more right. characters or something. His expansions are always, you know, he's not going to spend the time doing it unless it's really going to add to the gameplay and create something unique and new. So with his games, any game I have of his, I'm always really, you know, and this is one of the exceptions where with that um, name as the designer, if it's an expansion, I'm taking a look at it because I know there's going to be a lot 
in there in that yes. box that's going to give you options for not the, more the, of the same. Definitely, definitely not. Yeah. No, he really likes because I think you know, especially for him, he'll think of five different ways to do a thing, and so the expansions really give him a place to kind of you know run off in those directions that maybe he had to pull back on so that it didn't have too much for people to to wrap their brains around um so yeah so anachrony i've had a great time playing anachrony um even with uh, i have a more novice game group and even they really mm -hmm. were able to understand it because the steps you have to take while you really do have to plan each step of it as you said um, they're pretty straightforward once you understand the game. You know, I need this to do this. And yeah. um, that's a case I feel like the theme helps you understand what you're doing. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. It, all those those persnickety little rules that compound and build on top of each other, every single one of them is thematically grounded. Yes. And if you teach this game from a thematic perspective, mm -hmm. it's an easy game to learn. Yes. If you, and uh, and yeah, and again, that is that is kind of the, the modus operandi of... Uh, of Mind Clash as a publisher. I, yes, I and I yeah. really, David Turtsey is a designer, um, you know, because as we said, like, Petrichor Cows is his expansion for Petrichor that's that's out right now on Kickstarter. And Sam, Did we mention up front, folks? Go check it out. Petrichor yeah. <laughs> Cows on Kickstarter now. Uh, but that's another game of his where the expansion, I mean, it adds climate, it does all these things, but it makes such thematic sense that even though the rules overhead on that is as much as the base game, it's super easy to learn because you're like, okay, you have cows. They release methane. If they release methane, that means there's some fertilizer involved. And cows don't like to stand next to their fertilizer, so they're going to take a step a tile away. The, yep. the theme of that makes you're like, uh-huh, okay, that's, mm -hmm. that's how that would work. And so that's the same with anachrony where you can really explain it thematically in a way that's going to cement for people playing yeah. the game, even if they're new to gaming or are not experienced yeah. with a heavier game. All right. Well, then we both dig my number five, Anachrony. Yes. What's your number four? Uh, okay. So my number four uh -oh. is a genre, um, but oh. for reasons. Because when we're talking about people and bringing them into heavier games in the hobby, it's kind of easier to talk about 18xx as 18xx. Oh, of course. Sure, 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 sure. Yes. <laughs> so your number four is 18xx. It is. And I will give some examples because I know I'm always asked, you know, what my favorites are. Yeah. Yes, um, now we have to do a sub top 10 sub where you count down which your top 10 of number four. Yes, and so that would be 1822 is currently my favorite. Um, so that would be the first one I recommend to people playing because I really, really do enjoy that one. 1889 as well, I think, is an easier one to get into. Um, and then 1846, which is a little bit different than most people. A lot of people recommend people start playing 1846 first. I don't. Um, I think it is 1846 has some unique uh, rule sets that maybe make now, it not the best one to jump into first. But help me out here yeah. as an 18 um, XX runaway screaming. No, it's just not going to happen. You I appreciate so there's so good. many things out there yeah. in much the same way that I appreciate there are so many different flavors of sports ball. <laughs> But they're all just about taking a ball and putting it in a thing at the or end of the day to me. It. Yeah, you um, got it, yes. So 18xx games are all, I mean, I believe they are all, um, you know, 18 or 19th century rail route building yes. stock market manipulation games. That's what they all are, right? Yes. Why are that? in what way do, how can you just right off the top of your head list four completely different arbitrary 19th century dates and yet they have such a big impact on you even though they're all, from my perspective, because the they exact same game. Up. And so this is the thing. So, you know, we had these 18xx games. Again, we got Francis Tresham was involved in, in this process as well, right? Brought us into uh, this type of system. <laughs> Changed dramatically from his first, but like each one potentially changes dramatically you could have electronic trains that you know allow you the choice of which little um dot you uh jump over and which ones you count right and mm -hmm. so you're trying to make the most money you're a railroad baron right you're yes. creating this company you're running it and you're trying to make sure your trains make the most money for you simple simple concept this is this 
is, you know, you want to be efficient. You want to lay these tiles in an efficient way. You, everybody is going to have the same rules for what tiles they can lay, except yep. for maybe some rule breakers. And some games begin with an auction where you're going to bid on these rule breakers. But be careful yep. because we all start with the same amount of money. And so now we need to make sure that we still have money left to do the track lays and, you know, start the companies and par them and there's different choices you have for where you start companies what their value is you need to be able to par them at the right level so that it makes the most sense for you later on but oh no i made a mistake in my math and i don't have enough <laughs> money left not you just not you not your math your math uh, oh up. i do there's always <laughs> and this is the thing and this is where and that's a good segue to where people, I think, get stuck with it is we just talked about anachrony and how you yes. have to plan ahead on your turns yes. and make sure that you're building up for things. That is no different in 18xx. You are planning ahead your turns, deciding on where your optimal routes might be. Maybe people are going to go lay their own routes or get in your way or token you out of a hub station, but hopefully you can upgrade it. There's all these things that are just like anachrony where you're trying to build up and maybe somebody's going to get in your way or dominant species mm -hmm. same thing mm -hmm. somebody's going to get in your way for the choices of things that you can do and there's workarounds and as you dive into 18xx those are going to become apparent but i think where people make the mistake is for some reason because it's math it's really hard for them to understand instead of cubes or resources that we're converting math to oh, in those Euro games. You're saying because so much of the same types of considerations yes. you have, the same types same. of calculations you go through yes. in this game, they are all abstracted away. Yes. Um, in wow. other games. And it's not different. It's just a matter of you're dealing <laughs> with money. In a way, 18xx is a simplified version of those other games. It's just making it about money, straight points, yeah. versus converting it into the abstract of a resource. And then you're having to get the resource to use the resource to do this. 18xx is actually a level easier, I would argue, because you're just using your points to make more points. The um, 318... Oh, I'm sorry, go on. No, go ahead. The three eighteens you just mentioned. Yes. Would you say that they are, you know, just uh, looking at them in tandem, parallel to each other? Are they eighty percent the same game? And it's just there's a twenty percent variance that oh, well, this is the one that introduced auctions, and the rest of the time they don't have auctions. This is the one that introduced I um uh, mules or whatever. Yes. I don't even know what all they do. Maybe yes. there's one that does mules, and and that's what I mean. So it's almost like they're That'd all be the same game. We and it's just they're just variants. <laughs> I'll do it. Okay. Yes. But um, yes, in a way. I wouldn't, I, you know, saying 80% is actually a little bit limiting. I would okay. say some of them, you know, vary even more from the mm. core. Um, so some have a lot of variants and some have. What's the most far minor. out thing that oh, um, an 18 game does? Um, you know, like, and this is for my edification because it's probably a, a well I will never dive into, but I find it fascinating because I can just see it over there and it's like, oh my gosh, look at those people. They love it. Mm. So, and these are called MacGuffins, right? So your okay. MacGuffins are your things that are different. And honestly, I don't know. I wouldn't be the best person to ask about that because as much as I love 18xx, I haven't played it by far okay. as much as... Okay, you're not a scholar. No, I am so not a scholar in these games. Yeah. Um, and that's really what I want to kind of hammer home is I still fare very well in these games against scholars, people who mm -hmm. have played 18xx. They're in their, you know, they're approaching 2000 plays, right? Oh. They're who I'm playing with. But for me, the goal of an 18xx isn't necessarily that final end score. Yeah. And neither for these scholars. What they would mm -hmm. tell you is the goal is to learn something new. And so maybe you've played 1822 40 times, yeah. but on this time, you're gonna take the route in a whole new direction, or you're gonna start the company that everybody says you shouldn't start first. Mm -hmm. And you're just gonna see what you can do with it. And you're gonna see why that yeah. isn't the best company to start first. And you can see, hey, you know what? Actually, I discovered something new. If you start this company and then you know, a couple of rounds later start this company and connect them, it's actually a powerhouse. And that's what these scholars are doing is they're manipulating the gameplay 
And, you know, you talked about how you love, you know, that kind of sandboxy style where you can, you know, go and grab. And in many of the games you just mentioned, you were like, there's so many different paths you can take. Yeah. And that's exactly why I would tell you, you would love 18xx. See, it's interesting. I think not. Because while <laughs> I love the existence of, yes. a, of a universe of possibilities, mm -hmm. I generally, and I think for the most part, these games back that up. I generally look for some kind of overarching structure that narrows the focus, narrows that field of view down to, right. yeah, but you know what? Based on the way, based on the, the starting tiles I got or based on you know what my special power is, I probably of, of the 500 things I can do, I really want to probably focus on these three or four. That's fine. Um, yeah. You and I mean, do I don't that. have the impression that 18xx does that. That 18xx oh, is like, oh, really? Okay. Yep, you can sit there and say, you know what, I'm going to take this route down here and everybody's up here and I'm going to stay away from you all. And I mean, you don't have control over what they do. They could decide sure. to come join up with you, but that's the same in the games you're talking about. So you absolutely can turtle up in an 18xx. That doesn't mean it's going to win you the game. It may, though, because if they're all battling it out up at the top and there's some takeover, hostile takeovers of companies and people tank, you know, tank stocks and you're down mm -hmm. here doing your own thing you could absolutely come out the leader in that game so there's a lot going on in the game and it's there's so much player interaction where you can get involved in other people's stuff or maybe there's limited tiles and maybe you upgrade things that that le doesn't leave enough for somebody else to upgrade what they needed there's a lot of interplayability and a lot of changes that are going to make playing this game over and over again just an unlimited proposition. And no, you don't have to know how all of these different things to work. <laughs> you can stay on your own path and stay. What in was your the own one path. you recommended again? 1822 would be the one that I would say start with first. Why? Um, uh, why? I really I felt that the rules for that one and you know the MacGuffins the different things that are in it were that's literally what the the 18xx fans go hey what are the MacGuffins in yes, this one yes yes wow um, okay so that's 18xx speak you're throwing at me now yeah that okay. and I I forget there's a reason there's a historical reason it's called that um, oh okay yeah a lot of the things in these are very uh, historically based and I love playing with the the group that I play with because. You know, and there's nothing that they won't throw at me. Like we'll sit down and they'll be like, "Okay, we're gonna play this one." Yeah, it's probably the hardest one. Let's go. And let's go. Yeah, there's no. They definitely don't um, coddle me in any way. Like they're just like, "Let's go. You're gonna learn this game." And you know, to your point, initially they would help me with all the tile lays. So probably oh, the sure, sure. first four or five times I played the game, they were putting everything down, or they I would be like, "I want to go well, that's this just way." Polite. I mean, if somebody's new to the table. Yep. And they would help with that. But it got to a point where I was almost beating Eric Brocious a lot. So much that I was changing his gameplay so that he would end the game early because I was about to. Are you to... calling him out? Yeah, I, he would. He will tell you this. He's a good friend. <laughs> and he would say, like, and so he actually told the group, the group that we play with, and he was like, no more help for Jess. None. Nope. <laughs> Lay your own tiles. You're going to have to think about it. You're going to have to see what's limited. Because he would tell me, like, oh, I'm using this last one. Now, now he wouldn't. He was like, you're you done. Have, you have graduated. To you graduated, and there's no help. Yeah. And that really, so having that intro of, like, okay, they're putting things out, that helped. And then it really cemented my learning of these games when I had to do it. Because now, yeah. and so we yeah. talked about, because I had a separation of the game until he made me do what I needed to do. Um, and so, and now I, you know, I feel comfortable teaching or, or playing these games. But again, I do not have the breadth of knowledge because there's so many. Yeah, um, it could be your life, definitely. It is a lifestyle this. game for so many people. Yeah, definitely. and there are people who, you know, they call it, you know, this this rabbit hole you can go into. They're like, oh, you're playing 18xx, bye. Like, you'll, yep. you'll never play another game. But that is the breadth of options that are available in it, that you can just play these and be getting many similar experiences, and they would argue better, to some of the games that are coming out um, that are taking this type of thing and, and making it, you know, switch over to resources or do this or do that. So right. I'd, I'd argue that they're more straightforward than people think. And again, the fact that we're talking about, you know, what, six rules changes maybe in some of these games, um, 1822 is six um, things that are different about it than maybe your base yeah. 18xx. And then, and that's how you teach these games. Once somebody knows an 18xx, that really opens up 
a world of possibilities to people. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid of 18XX. If you get yeah. a chance to try I'm afraid, it, Jess. do it. I can handle brass. I can handle <laughs> railways of the world. Then you can handle 18XX. I promise you. It's oh. not that, but don't worry about winning. I can't, when I can't stress that enough when you're, that in is, this, that is good advice in general. Yeah, definitely. it is. Just, just play, enjoy it. Yep. Enjoy the experience. That was your number four, correct? The 18 four. XX series. Yes. All right. That's a big one. It is. Uh, mine is not quite so big to follow that up. Uh, okay. And I'm interested to hear what you think about it. It's uh, my first Vita Lasarda game on the list. Uh, my third that I've mentioned, because two of his games made my list five years ago. It is CO2. Oh. Specifically, Second Chance. Because here's the deal. When I did this list uh, a few years ago, and what, what did I get? What, which ones did I call out five years ago? Vinos and Kanban. Um, and both of those would have made this list as well if I wasn't just, you know, giving you like giving viewers another 10 on top of the 10 I did before. CO2 didn't make my list back then because CO2 has always struck me as one of uh, Vito's lighter games. It was one of his earlier ones. Yeah. And I was shocked, shocked, I tell you, Jess, when I saw how high the CO2 second chance rates. Now, in part, again, I believe, and you know, and you can compare CO2 versus CO2s, uh, or CO2 original versus second chance. The original one is quite a bit lower on the ranking scale. I suspect in part, this is once again, it's new, fewer people have played it. It probably will normalize a bit lower, but CO2 second chance is very, very interesting because it does two things. It is a revisiting of the gameplay of CO2, kind of streamlining mm -hmm. uh, and simplifying a lot of the, the uh, sharper edges of the original CO2, uh, how scientists work and whatnot. Right. Um, so if anything, it's almost an easier, more straightforward game, but it introduces a cooperative variant you can play. And based on our previous discussion, I'm assuming you've never even tried it. Oh, I um, have. Oh, you have? Okay, yes. well, I'm very curious because, damn, that's a hard uh, cooperative yes. game. It is monster hard. My wife, we both love CO2. CO2 by itself is a semi-cooperative game where we are all competing to be energy companies trying to produce the, mm -hmm. you know, make the most points by producing energy for the world uh, in a time when we need to switch from traditional fossil fuels to green energy sources. And if we don't, on some level, work together mm -hmm. to keep our emissions down, everybody loses. Yeah. And um, and I, I've, we've always loved CO2 because there will always come a point where we're mostly just playing, where we're, you know, grabbing all these different markets and building up and, oh, you started something, I'm going to finish it. There's a lot of interplay between players in that regard. Um, we're both doing uh, symposiums together with our scientists because we've learned different things from different technology tracks. But sooner or later, we are not, because we are competing, we are not being as efficient as the world needs us to be yes. to avoid hitting thresholds that, you know, points of no return. And, um, and so there comes a point every time we play where, okay, we have to put our competitive side for this next round. You need to do this and I need to do that. And oh, but if you do this, then we can do that. And we have to work together or we both lose. Yes. And Jen and I, we love that so much. Oh, we, 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 we solved that problem. Okay, we can go back to competing now. Yeah. Uh, absolutely adore it. And I see so many people hate on it so much uh, because the common complaint about semi-co-ops of, oh, I feel I'm losing. I'm just going to do everything I can to make sure everybody loses because that means I tied for first. Oh, no. Because see, we all lost. And it's like, no, you tied for last yes, because the game you won. lost. Don't play with those people would be my Exactly. <laughs> Please, because you're missing out such a great game. What uh, do you think of yes. CO2? I like CO2. Um, yeah, we did. I played it on stream. We, we streamed this one. And it's definitely one of those things where you have to be like, okay, are we all going to work together? And, and they could lie. They could be like, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the thing that, that brings out more CO2. Why would I do that? No. Yep, yep. Um, but then they do. And they're like, well, we're going to lose anyway. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> So it teaches you a lot of who you're playing with, definitely. Yes. Uh, and it's it's super interesting because there's these things you want to do, but the impact on the environment is right in your face. Like you're going to lose. You don't have that choice yep. of, uh, oh, well, you know, this, this hurts everybody else. I'm going to do it. It hurts you too. So yeah, CO2 was uh, a good co-op for me, um, for mm -hmm. the way my brain works and being able to calculate because I'm allowed to do my own things without yes. it being the only thing that impacts everybody else. There's a piece of it that impacts other people and choices that you get to make 
together, but not really together. It's your choice. It's still on mm -hmm. your sh shoulders. It just impacts everyone. Oh. Um, so I did enjoy uh, CO2. It's never going to make like a top list for me because yeah. it's so player dependent and because that experience for me of, I mean, I think this is why I don't like in-person werewolf. Strangely, I like werewolf when it's like in a Slack channel or something, but in-person werewolf, I, I end it thinking, wow, all my friends are horrible liars. Like I just... <laughs> These are terrible people. And so, they couldn't have come up with that if there wasn't a kernel of truth to it. Yeah. Ugh. And so ah. that's the same thing for like this this type of game. As you mentioned, it's a little bit player dependent in that if you have people who are just like, never mind, I'm losing. I'm going to ruin it for everyone. You're like, what? Like that just. <laughs> um, so, yes. yeah. yeah. So that's, it's that's interesting. You learn as much about your fellow players yes. in that game. Yes. Yeah. That's a really good way to put it. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of foreign to me because I know my wife. I know what I'm getting into when I sit down with her, but you're right. That's really, I like that a lot. Maybe and things I didn't four. want to know about the people yeah. I'm playing. With. Exactly. Exactly. Um, can't put that genie back in the bottle. So no. CO2, second chance. And specifically, yeah. I do think it earns, well, in my original, I didn't think it was heavy enough to make it into my top 10 heaviest based on its weight. I do think that co-op does push it over the top because that co-op is up mm. there. You mentioned earlier with Robin Crusoe yes. in terms of, Man, this game is so hard. Oh yeah, I think I've lost yeah. it. Uh, yeah, I'm at like 66. percent We lose. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's very very hard. It depends on how those tiles come out and what's what's happening, right? For the yep. for the carbon dioxide, it's not a good thing. So no. what is your number three? My number three is Pax Premier Second Edition. Okay. All right. Um, oh, the new one. Yes, right. The new one, yes. Cole Worley. Now, I will say that I had to manipulate um first edition in my list for this um and i decided not to put first edition in but i do like there's the biggest difference between first edition and second edition they're totally okay. different games yes first edition you don't really know who's winning right and it can be that somebody's manipulated things so that they win and then they just reveal okay i won the game and so what cole was looking to do with second edition is make it more obvious um mm -hmm. how the gameplay was working um, things can still change, and but you can see, oh, you have enough money to buy that card if it comes out, and if you buy it, you know, depending on what comes out into the board here, then the game could end pretty quickly. You can kind of see what other people are building up and what they're doing with their tableau. Um, so that's the big difference there. I tend the game to setting is still the same, right? It's still afghan year of colonization, the history tribal is still leaders. The same. It's still it's, the same okay, period. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's just he's tried to change the feel. The feel of it, because he felt that it was better for people to see and know. Game there were state. too many sneaky players like you. Yeah, and see, I like to... that. Yeah. <laughs> so I like that. I miss that about first edition, and yet I understand why he brought it in this direction. And for me, what I want to talk about here is, you know, for Pax Premier Second Edition, you have your tableau, you're grabbing your cards, yes. you're building up your tableau size. Each card has a different symbol that maybe lets you have a bigger hand size, or maybe, um, you know, a do and then take actions your actions are on your cards that you can take maybe for free or use as an action instead of taking or playing a card to your tableau so all these different things are happening money it's a closed uh, economy system so money is pretty tight um and you have to watch what cards you're buying because you're placing money out on the tab the board to get maybe cards that just came out that maybe are those prize cards but you're not gonna necessarily you get that back like it's it's a really tight game to manage and manipulate, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yet, these concepts are so simple as far as a rules overhead of, of what you're doing yes. that you can teach this to somebody pretty easily. Um, and then to master it, like you said with Go, it's going to take forever. And for me, with PAX Premier Second Edition, it took until my third play of it. I was playing it when it was being play tested okay. um, with Cole at different cons. I got to see different iterations of it. But it took until my third play of it to really understand what I was doing. I was pretty much fumbling around until then. And then you start to get how this interplay works and how maybe burning a card once somebody puts one of their spies on it is a good thing. And, you know, just different aspects that you can take um, that you weren't seeing the benefit of um, when you learned the rules in just like their simplest form. So 
this game has changed for me over time. And if you look at my lists over time, it's jumped up and down <clears throat> because at first I, I didn't know what I was doing. Then I understood the game and got the strategy. Okay. I like it more. Then I kind of got to a point where it felt really cutthroat because okay. the people I was playing with, we really attack each other. It's great at two player um, as well, but it's a very different feel at two player. Obviously it ramps up to take that because it's just back and forth. Um, and so I started to be like, oh, I, I, I don't like how much, in, and this is weird for me to say, how much take that there is. I don't know about this. <laughs> and I backed away from it. Then I started playing it some more and I was like, oh, but it's so cool how these things work together and how you can switch sides and maybe plan for switching sides and no one sees it's coming. And so where I talked about how I missed that open, that, uh, hidden game state of, um, first edition i started to see in second edition how you could hide things maybe your master plan wasn't as obvious as your tableau made it seem maybe you were actually looking to do some straw man things with your cards and switch things up um yeah so that's when this really so you can still be sneaky shine. you're saying oh yeah and that's when you what found your sneaky again yeah yeah what then that is really interesting um i'm not familiar with the original one it's interesting though that you have, just based on your personal preference playing style, a predilection towards the first, but you still elevate the second. Yes. It's just, you know, that even though you lost maybe some of the heart of what made you love the game so much, the changes he made, the improvements, the enhancements, mm -hmm. the card play, I assume, more than anything else, is so far above and beyond that you still had to give it to the to the sequel. Yes, and that that being said, you know, now realizing that I actually didn't lose some of those hidden yes. elements that yeah, I yeah. thought I did because as I started to get more immersed in understanding strategy, you know, it's again back to that go. As you mm -hmm. get more experienced with it and realize the layers that are there, it can still be there. I just didn't see it. And now I do and that's to me the game itself, my plays of the game took me on a journey, right? So instead mm -hmm. of it just being about uh, limited to the experience of each game, each time I played, it brought me somewhere different um, with the game. And that is why it's, I think, going to stay very, very high on my top games for a long time because it's so different. And I will add that I taught my now 13-year-old daughter this game Oh, wow. And honestly, I thought it was above her head. I was like, oh, she's not going to. She understood the symbols. We as adults tend to overthink things, especially yeah. as gamers. And yeah. she understood those symbols right away. She got exactly what Cole was trying to put out there for that. And so she took to the game easily. The more I tried to explain as we played, she was like, yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> why are you telling me that? <laughs> and... Um, yeah, so she thought it was obvious and she did a thing, um, that I, I shared with Cole too, because I knew it would make him proud. She actually worked with her siblings to kill me. So oh, she wow. didn't even care about winning. She's like, I'm just going to make sure you don't win. And so I'm going to make sure they do. And I'm going to keep, and she, everything I did, every time I tried to change routes, she would just come in and undercut me immediately. And I was like, how do you see this? It took me three plays. I'm going to say that I'm a good teacher. Clearly. Oh, there you go. Yes. But yeah. So this it's is in the genes. Game. Yeah. It's in the genes. Apparently. Yep, yep. There's um, nature and nurture going on this time. Yes. And so she, she really took it and ran with it, but that showed me you can teach this to new players. Yeah. 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 They're even going to discover oh, yeah. something that when you I, didn't know. Yeah. When I, when I saw, um, you know, I haven't covered it, but Shay, my contributor on the channel, when he covered it, I was blown away. It's incredible. It, there, there is so much. I mean, if anybody were to look at this game and you say, well, how does this make anybody's top 100 heavy games? It's, it's just, it's a little trifle. It's a, it's, it's a deck of cards and a tiny little map. What is there? Sure. And it's like, <laughs> man, it's game for days. Yes. Yeah. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, too bad it's also a game with a fair amount of area control and dollop and sneakiness and cutthroatedness. And, it really and is. It's hard Sneaky to mom say. versus cutthroat daughter. Yes. Who will win? Yeah, it's, you know, and there are things you can play in this game where oh, you yeah. can go after somebody for no reason yeah. and just be like, ah, I'm going to do it because I have an action left. I'm going to, I'm just going to do this. Now that will have its own ramifications because I've sure. had that done to me and I was like, okay, 
Now I'm yep. just coming at you yep. for you no go. other purpose than you did that to me. <laughs> I <laughs> would, like, I would so wish for Cole to revisit the mechanisms and the structure for that game, but turn it into an engine builder, just yeah. a Euro goods conversion kind of thing, but still the same card play and tableau building and all that. Right. Cause it's so brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. Make it something, a variant where you could turtle up, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. you could actually just be competing for, I did better in my building yep. here and what I took. And so it's not so take that -y. Maybe, maybe that's someday. Right. someday. Yeah. <laughs> so that's an excellent number three. Pax Premier, number two, second mm -hmm. edition. All right. My number three what is Cooper Cooper Island. Fair. Uh yeah, that's a good one. That's a fantastic one. And you know, this this is a this is I I definitely think this warrants being here. This is a very heavy game. There's a lot going on, although at its heart, it is a very simple, clean worker placement game with a couple little wrinkles about how you can upgrade your workers and all that. Um and you know, like some of the other ones I've mentioned. It's several games all at once because I know from my understanding from the development of it started out with we really want to make this tile laying but also stacking game and uh, you know and and that's still kind of the heart of the game because you're exploring Cooper's Island by laying these um, double hex tiles and you know expanding outwards but also building upwards mm -hmm. and um, as you build higher and higher that means these spaces are getting taller and taller will produce more for you. And you're like, oh, this is fantastic. I'm getting all these resources. They're going to drive all these other things I need to do. But sooner or later, I want to put one of my buildings on the top of this little mountain I've made. Yep. Because that's where the points are. Yep. And there, and then my entire economy just collapsed. It does. Um, and but that you know that's on me. And everybody's yes. doing this simultaneously. It's so brilliant. And I think the thing that I m was most blown away by the first time I played it, and my wife, she completely unprompted said the same thing the first time she played it is. Jeez, I have to work so hard to make three points yes. in this game. Yes. This, I, but but it's but yeah, and that might sound terrible, but it's amazing. Yes. Um, that uh, you know, you know, that there's so much, and you can get, uh, you know, in any other game, it was like that was like a hundred points worth of work, and well, yeah, I might have made six, and that's amazing that I yes. pulled that kind of move off, and it took me half the game to do it. Mm -hmm. Um. But when you get the satisfaction of those plans coming together, because there are so many things you're balancing, so many different sub games, like going back to um, you know Black Angel, it's 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 just phenomenal. It's got a great presentation too. It's also unlike uh, games some people tend towards, uh, <laughs> a little bit more live and let live. Hey, I'm on my side of the island. You're on yes. your side of the island. Yeah. But you know what? And the you stuff even have I to give goods if you take something from somebody, right? Or you go on top of their tile or whatever you can still do it you just give a good to another player. exactly yeah i mean yeah it's it's again it's a it's a mutual benefit yes um hey uh, you know i might make it over to your side of the right. island eventually but that just means so i can activate your ports um oh why did i put those ports on that side of the island ah! yes. you know it's it's phenomenal really blows me away and just thinking about it makes me want to play it right now it, it is a really, really good game. So we've actually streamed that twice because yeah. we adopted a dog whose name is Cooper. Of course. Yeah. And so we and, had and to... the, it's named after a real life dog. It uh, is. The designer's dog oh, is named Cooper yeah, as well. Yeah, Oda's uh, dog as well is Cooper. And so... Did your dog get named Cooper after Cooper Island? No, because okay. we adopted him at five. So he was already named okay. Cooper. Um, All right. So he came with his name, but we did stream that first with him as like, his introduction <laughs> uh, to streaming because he is bored game dog on twitter he has a lot of followers actually oh hey yeah <laughs> if you want to know more folks hit that link yep. down in the show notes right now <laughs> so you've got board game girl and you've got board, board game, game dog. dog yeah he's doing well so yeah he's actually on his little dog bed uh hanging out with me in here because he he's he's a really good board game dog but cooper <laughs> yeah cooper island is deceptively hard and you know i how many times when you were playing it rado did you say like I don't want to move my ship right now. <laughs> it's gonna, it. it's gonna pass a tile. I could have put something there, but yep, you got yep, yep. points, and you're like mad about your points. You're like, mm. I don't want the points yet. <laughs> <laughs> I need more time. I need more time to build yeah, yeah. these. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting in what you have to decide for and against in that game. It's really, really tight. Yeah. Yeah. Good choice. Excellent. Well, I, I agree. How about number two? Number two is Bios Origins. Oh, yeah. 
Edward you, convinced me I want to play this one too. When I you when will I did, like uh, this one. Yeah, there yeah. is no doubt in my mind. Um, this is not you know when people hear BIOS or the BIOS series, I think they think again a rule book that's going to be insurmountable. I'm not going to be able to get this to the table. No. And this is a origin of the Earth, you yes. know, continents, you know, for <laughs> fauna and flora and fauna. I can't think anymore. We've been talking for so long, but it's yes. one of those kinds of yeah prehistory sort of. It yeah. is. It's the Super you know as as you're you know growing as your civilization and so you're starting as these um you know potentially neanderthals there's different asymmetrical uh players uh that you can choose from but you're starting out and you you know you have to grow your intelligence you know with evolution over time and so you're starting out with these conditions and then you're trying to get smarter and discover things and and go out onto the cards for discovery yeah um and this is and, but you have to build up and other people have to join you in order for you to make these discoveries potentially, or you have to really invest to make these discoveries and go, uh, you know, hard onto them. And so it's really interesting in that interplay, there are things where somebody might take something from you, but to your point, you get some, mm -hmm. you get a benefit yes. of that, right? Yeah. So there's that back and forth. Um, even if somebody discovers something you're on, you really wanted it, but it's okay fine, I'll take my benefit and, and move on. And so it really is interesting how these the, it progresses over time. There's three periods um, that you go through and they each have their own scoring mechanism. And that I really love about it because you can go really fast really? into that first era and uh -huh. score really well there because you're only going to score one of them. Then you don't so, even okay, have to- Okay, so there are three eras each yes. era has three potential scoring options yes. and you choose one? Well, you're starting, when you're in that first era, that's the one that's going to score. So you're okay. going for the most there if you want to score the most there. But maybe yep. you have a better plan okay. to score okay. an error two or error three and you want to wait and do that, but that's a risk right. because somebody else already scored really well in error one. And so you've got to beat their score in error two mm -hmm. or error three because you're only going to score in the error. Because the metrics change. The Mm -hmm. uh, you know, halfway and, through the game, oh, we don't care about that anymore. No. I, you know, and either you committed yeah. to that, and hopefully that you ride that to victory, or you ignored it to prepare for what's coming in era or two. Maybe or maybe found a way for it to interplay together, right, so you right. can pivot quickly to era two. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's ever changing, and it's super interesting how that works and how you're going to impact other players as that's working out. So this is one that again. It's, it's back to that go level of strategy. I really yeah. don't feel the rules overhead on this are not as bad as what you would think from a BIOS type game. Mm -hmm. You have five things that you need to know. Um, there's a whole Rosetta Stone of 40 symbols that are going to come up in the game. You do not need to know those. Just have <laughs> the Rosetta Stone next to you. Yeah, yeah. And when those come up, look at the Rosetta Stone and say, oh, what's that symbol? Oh, that's going to allow me to move my follower here. Okay, that makes sense. But it's at its core, these five or six that you are going to use regularly. That is not a lot to remember. You can do this, right? Like, and they're right in front of you and you just are constantly creating an engine around them, but other things will come into play. And the big thing I think that Ion Games did that helped with this type of game is having that Rosetta Stone where they're all right mm. there for you. But okay. where people I think get stuck is they see that and think, I can't possibly remember all those things. Run you away. do not need to. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, run away. And you don't have to. You only have to do your core. The other things are going to be extraneous as they come up. But you've talked about Gloomhaven. Same yeah. thing, right? You yes. really only need to know your core things. There's a lot of other things that are going to come up during the game, but just handle those as the game yeah. progresses it's not going to be that hard to tack them on and that's that's what's happening in bios origins so i think it's a great way for people to get into a heavier game so you're going to see again in my list i really that is a big consideration for me can i play this with my kids can i play this with newer gamers and introduce them to heavy games this way does it have a way for me to kind of ramp them up in this game and bios origins does that gateway yeah. heavy games mm -hmm. which is not something people normally consider yeah. i know it totally exists i swear yeah all right <laughs> i'll take your word for it all right so that was number two bios origins my yeah. number two is my other vita lasarda game the gallerist oh so good 
Oh, so good. Oh, yes. so very good. Um, and, I, and actually, I believe it is my wife's favorite of Vital's games uh, because she herself okay. is an artist. And, yeah. um, you know, this really typifies what he does, which is, you know, he makes incredibly rich, complex, interwoven um, systems that are incredibly thematically grounded. Yeah. Um, and while what you choose to do from round to round is incredibly simple, this is a worker placement game with one worker. Mm -hmm. That's all you got. And you only have four worker placement spots to go to on the entire board. <laughs> That's your whole turn. In theory, yes. you just take my worker, put it on one place, and then wait for my next turn. But somehow within that, you know, level upon level, layer upon layer, just kind of explodes as you are trying yes. to basically run the most successful art gallery you can by finding artists and developing them so that they can, uh, you know, become greater so that the works that they produce for you will ultimately um, lead to your prestige, your gallery, or to heck with that. Let's just, oh, that 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 uh, artist, you put all that time and attention and love into? Yeah, I'm just going to get his latest work and put it in my gallery. Now, thanks. Right. That's going to work out great. Um, and, you know, but not just worrying about the artist, not just worrying about the gallery, but worrying about the, uh, the what is it, the gallery goers, that uh, a sizable amount of this time is just about uh, advertising. And marketing, yes. uh, you know, getting people to come in and appreciate the works you've put on. And again, so much, and you can't possibly do it all. So you really do have to focus, um, you know, on a few different things, but all of it driven by one single worker. It's 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 absolutely insane mm -hmm. how rich richness there is. And, you know, this is a trick he pulled off in Kanban as well, another worker placement game where there was only one worker. Yep. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm forever impressed by him. And I think the thing that makes... What at first seems like just an overwhelming, daunting, unsurmountable amount of stuff, of rules, is the fact that every single rule makes thematic sense. If mm -hmm. you just start from the point of, well, yeah, you're a gallery owner. Of course this is what you want to do. So what would you do? You would do this. And that's how this game works. And I'm, I'm very impressed by it. I've been impressed by everything VTOL has done. Yes. And it's interesting. I guess this means, officially at this point anyway, although maybe not Mars. Uh, I don't have a final copy of Mars. I've only played the prototype of it. Maybe Mars is actually ranked higher according to Board Game Geek in terms oh, of heaviness. Yeah, on Mars is pretty heavy. I would, I would yeah, say that. Yeah, yeah, it definitely, it definitely is. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if it ultimately takes its top. Yeah. But for us, uh, we love the Gallerist so much. I can see that. Yeah, the Gallerist is absolutely a phenomenal game. Though I'd say that's one too, where as simple as you can make it. And he always, uh, Vital always says, "My games are easy. There's only two <sighs> actions you can take. Just pick." He is a no silly man. Can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're he, like, he know, he knows what he's saying. He yeah, knows. he know. I know. He he likes yeah. to he likes to poke the bear. But it it actually it is simple in what you ha can do, but you have to set things up. And I mean, how many times have you said like, oh no, I don't have a person in my gallery. I can't do the thing. Oh, I forgot. And, you know, so there's all these things that, you know, <laughs> we're talking about, again, 18xx, people are always like, oh, that's just a bridge too far. And I'm like, are you kidding me? If you if you love the gallerist and that is your number two and one of your favorite Vital Asserta games. Well, it's Board Game Geek's number two. Yeah. Um, oh, it's, true, I, I, true. I, I could look up where it is, but we, we do absolutely love it. It's yeah. interesting too. Um, so Gallerist, I think, I mentioned this earlier, that Feast for Odin is kind of like a perfect sweet spot. Yes. For us, something like Gallerist is kind of um, scraping the upper edge, okay. you know? That, you know, this far and no further. I, and, I, I hear I, you. Yeah. yeah. And because it, it occurred to me, of course, Lisboa goes further. Mm -hmm. Lisboa is another Vita Lasarda super heavy Euro, is one that goes too far. And I think On Mars might be. I need to play it a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Gallerist, I think, defines the upper edge. Uh, Madeira, which was in my first list I did five years ago, is another mm -hmm. one where Madeira, sometimes I feel like, nope, it's over the edge too much. <laughs> or sometimes it's just right on the edge. Depending, I, I think, on what it just tries to throw at you the last time you play it. But, yeah, I mean, I, I'm amazed by... I can't imagine what his brain is like to come up with... I mean, because there's nothing... It's elegant, yes. but it's incredibly complex at the same time. Mm -hmm. And theme ties it all together. And, I mean, he's just the best Yeah, that's a really good question. I wonder if he looks at it from the standpoint of theme or starts with he must. mechanism. Yeah. I, I assume I mean, he definitely must. the theme gets in there. I yeah. just wonder where it starts. It's like chicken or the egg, right? Like, yeah, which one definitely. does it start with? Because it definitely, you know, bleeds through. It makes perfect thematic sense that this is what you need and this is how you build up, which really does help with that heavy level, for sure. Yeah. Yep. All right. Hey, we, we, we've made it. Folks, we if you are still here, it. let's spend a half an hour revisiting all the lists we don't. No, let's just go on. <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> to what? What is your number one, Jess? All right. So what tops everything else? Yes. Uh, most people who know me will know what my number one is. I was wondering whether I could include this on a heavy list, and we had a little bit of discussion about this before we started. Oh. Um, but okay. I decided after looking at some of the ones um, on your list and looking back on some of mine that this does still qualify. There are no wrong answers. Yes, on my list, and that is Ginkopolis. So except for that, that's a wrong answer. No. <laughs> it is not. It is always the right answer. And I wonder how its rating will actually be impacted if there ever is a successful well, reprint it, of it. It's coming, right? Hasn't it been announced? I'm pretty sure it's been announced. This has been announced several times. So, okay, so you're I not will counting not your hold my breath until it actually happens. You are um, not counting your Ginkopolises until they hatch. No, nope, because I've done so before. But I think and I understand why it's been delayed um, on multiple reasons, both from um, the designer and uh, original publisher aspect. But also, this is a deceptively hard game to teach. And we just talked about, mm -hmm. you know, games that, okay, it makes perfect thematic sense. So it's easy to understand and we can get through these concepts. Yeah. It's not necessarily a hard game to play, but there are a lot of moving aspects to this game that maybe don't make the best thematic sense and so i think that's where people get tripped up in the game the other that thing you you don't have something yeah, I think that can you can a short i mean we're making this weird future colony a post green world where yes. everything's organic and grown instead and for of some built reason, and, and what ginkgo does that mean trees, and who are these people yes. yeah and ginkgo trees mean everything right they're now yeah. our currency um, which many people don't realize until they've played the game multiple times, that the ginkgo leaves are actually the currency. And then we have these different symbols, and they're also on the tiles. And these are things that aren't necessarily called out in the rulebook. So Ginkopolis needs a really good teach, even though it is three actions. There's three things you can do. Yeah. Um, so this is not a really hard game to play. Uh, for rules overhead, but it definitely is a very hard game for some people to grasp. And that's why I really do think okay. it still belongs on a heavy game list because it's not your entry level game. It's not your midweight when you think of all the things that have to play together. You're building a tableau. That tableau is going to get you benefits on each action that you take. You're drafting cards so you're not even, unless you have a perfect recall memory, sure of exactly what yeah. you're going to get or have available to you as it goes around. And you need certain things to happen. And as the board grows and moves, you know, you're building up, you're building out, um, you're sprawling. So things change that really impact your gameplay and maybe somebody else is taking over the ultimate end of game scoring which is your area control um which i always say to people don't worry about too much in the beginning because it's gonna all change by the end yeah. so there's so much consideration in things and you have to time things right i need to build up my tableau yes. early but i need to make sure i have end game scoring stuff before the game ends and you don't actually completely know when the game's going to end. This is not round-based. This is based mm -hmm. on tiles, but it's not solely based on how many tiles you have left because once the tiles are out, everybody has the opportunity to take tiles from their hand that they may have been hoarding yes. and put in for points, and then the game continues until those tiles are out. So there's so much of a hidden element of like, I'm, I think I'm gauging it right. Am I gauging it right? When's the game going to end? Nobody put tiles back in. Oh no, game's over. And I needed like two more turns to make what I needed to happen, happen. Yeah. So that's why this is a really difficult game to, to conceptualize or to strategize in because um, so many things are up in the air. Um, but it's beautiful. And the reason that I love it is going to belie all my reasons that I liked all the other games. Um, it's not actually, or, or fly in the face of, I should say, it's not actually about the mechanisms, though I think they're good yeah. mechanisms. I like tile yeah. laying and I like card drafting to a degree. Actually not my favorite thing. Um, mm. And then the theme, I said, I like it when the theme's immersive and teaches you something historical. And this is an abstract. No. They, this is clearly, they came up with a the theme after the fact yes. to justify this None tile laying through. stacking game. Yeah. Nope. So neither of those things are in play here. The reason I love this game, it is, I would argue, 
with my last breath, this is the perfect dev. There is no game that was developed more perfectly than wow. Gingopolis. And okay. when I develop a game, my like this to me is the holy grail. If you can develop a game that is this perfect, um, because those three actions, they do everything. Yeah. That's it. With three actions, you're able to play this game where you're either playing a card that is going to go into your tableau um, because you built up and covered another tile so that tile, that card is no longer used in the game. So instead of developing this where, okay, throw the tile out, you know, this card out of the game because you built on top of it so it's not going to come up again. No, they didn't do that. They said, okay, if it's not going to be used in the game, it becomes part of your tableau. Mind blown. That's beautiful. You just used <laughs> yeah. the card instead of saying throw it away. So yep. that becomes your tableau. If you build out that tile is still available so you have to put it back into the deck because somebody could potentially build on top of it and then well what do you do when you're out of resources you burn a card for resources and this is where people get stuck on this game no one likes a suboptimal turn sure mm -hmm. so no one wants to burn cards yeah. And what you have to learn in Gengopolis is you are going to burn cards. And I always start my teach with that of like, please don't <sighs> get angry. We're all yeah. going to do it. And when you get to the point where you're like, there are no cards I can use in my hand, that's a great time Maybe. to gain resources. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. So don't worry about that too much. Take the opportunity to get your resources and then, you know, hope for better cards as it goes around. But the fact that then at the end the entire game changes and you really just you got to worry about your area control oh it's yeah. beautiful yeah it's interesting um if there's one consistent thing i'd have to go back and look at your full list um but you really are gravitating towards i think a, a lot of the weight of the games you chose come from the fact that they are mostly shared space shared building spaces mm -hmm. And because we are sharing this limited real estate, that layers on so much more depth, so much more complexity, because the human mind is a deep, complex thing to try to fathom. Right. Um, whereas a, a, a stark contrast to mine, but my wife and I tend to, can we just be in our own little, literally Cooper Island, if you build the island, it's this weird little thing where I've got my peninsula and you've got yours, and yes. we stay the heck away from each other. Um, and so the depth I've got does come more often from deeper, richer, more complex combinations of rules and whatnot, because the game has to throw that at us to be heavy, whereas you can find um, depth and and weight in Ginkopolis be, just because you're outthinking your opponents, knowing kind of what they can do, kind of what you need yes. to do, will they do, mm -hmm. and there's just... We have to build up because there's not very much room there. It's a tiny little board. No, that's, um, a, that's a really yeah. astute observation. I would agree with that because I'm kind, I like that space of... I know that you know that I know. Yeah. So are you going to use that or am I? Oh, and then you can burn your hand of cards to make sure I can't use the card you know I need. Yep. And so yep. there's, I like that interplayability. And I think that's a really good point. It probably comes from the fact that I also am really um, into video games. So I do mm. a lot of playing games solo. Um, whether okay. it's, you know, playing Civ on the Switch or playing, you know, other even... Uh, apps that allow me to play kind of tabletop games on apps or even just a regular video game, um, you know, like uh, RPG world that I'm going through, I get a lot of solo gaming experiences in. And so when I'm hitting the table yeah, with a group yeah. of friends, I actually want to delve into their minds and what makes them tick and kind of have that randomness, not from the game, but from the other players, because what they do could not make sense to me um, or just make sense, but isn't beneficial to me, clearly, and, and yep. impact my gameplay. So I want that interplayability. All right. Yeah, and you're not saying Ginkopolis is the heaviest of these. Remember, my list was no. a countdown towards heaviness. Your list was a countdown towards... What, I like what would best. you say? You were looking at your list. What is your actual heaviest game you would rate on your list? Uh, Let's see... I don't know why I'm drawing this out. Uh, yeah, but... I know. Well, no, the excitement. We, this but I'm, I'm, excitement yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a showman. That's all. <laughs> you are a showman. I would say uh, it'd be probably Dominant Species. Uh, Civilization's mm, yeah, yeah. pretty heavy, but without looking, and I'm, not, I'm purposely not yep, looking yep, yep, at their yep. 
BGG numbers. Um, see, because Bios Origin's second nature to me at this point. 18XX, I don't think is as heavy as people make it out to be. Right. So I wouldn't want to look at their scores um, <laughs> for that. Dominant Species has a lot of moving parts to it. So I, I would say it. Dominant Species is probably the heaviest in that list. All yeah. right. Um, well, uh, my number one is the heaviest on my list by far. I'll be curious to know what you think. Um, mm -hmm. It is another one of those games that straddles the edge. Um, but, and I think for the most part, it's, 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 just, it's just on our side of, of the edge of a bit too, uh, of, of, of an elephant too far because <laughs> it is Agra. Okay. Yeah. That game is a monster. It is physically it is. a monster. I'm pretty sure it's the biggest board I've talked about today. And it's gorgeous. Always it love gorgeous. the Michael Menzel. Um, and ostensibly, it's just a pretty simple, straightforward worker placement game, too. Um, sure but the thing, <laughs> I, I talked about this a bit ago um, on some of the other ones. The This game, more than I think any other game I've talked about, gives you, and maybe it's this is the kind of thing that you expect in an 18xx, and it's kind of far out for me. The freedom you have to do anything. Um, everything is all about, there's a million different ways to convert this good to this good. Um, and every good you get in this game, because this is at the end of the day, harvesting goods and converting them into points. We literally have little farms and we're just, we upgrade our farms and downgrade other farms so we can get good at making particular goods because either the, I forget, the, the emperor wants them or the guilds want them or the randomly selected uh, people want them. And there's just, a million ways to get these goods, a million ways to convert these goods, a million places to spend these goods and score these goods. Mm -hmm. And um, and the game just says, boom, there it is. There it all is. And, um, and I love that. Sure. And I would say that that would be too much sandboxness. But there's two things that the game does that really do, that, that, that helps Jen and I, or helps, uh, helps us focus like a laser, uh, that I love. One is the fact that the worker placement this, of this game is alive because there's not just our workers. There are automated systems. There's, what is it, the merchant and, I forget, it's like a little brown guy, the builder, I believe. Mm -hmm. And they are, they occupy worker placement spaces, potential worker placement spaces. And after I'm done, you know, and they create temporary value particular. I really need to generate, um, you know, lumber right now. But that's not where the merchant is. And if I visit him, um, you know, I'll be, or, or that, you know, and also the merchant moves around on his own, uh, you know, so, and he basically literally drops rupees wherever he goes. Right. Uh, yeah. you know, I do like that. Like, like this magical character, like, well, that's the last place I want to go, but there's three rupees on yep. there. I have it's, to go do that. Very action. enticing. Yes. But nobody wants that. But if I go there to get those rupees, I'll get these resources I don't need. And then I can go through a complex six-step process to convert them into what I actually need to get them to this person on the river. Because I'm about to cross into the second section of the river. And if I can get there first and make them happy. I mean, there is just wheels within wheels within wheels with this game. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah, like I, and, and it would be too much if it weren't for the fact that the setup. The variable people that are on the board that yes. all offer very exciting, very tantalizing trades for what you can generate for them. Or I could say, I'm just going to go take it off to the palace because there's there's a lot to be had there too. But how do I get these things? And the game is constantly basically throwing distractions at you. Yes. I know what I need to do. Yes. But I should I need to do this now because th because the builder is going to move. And if I don't take advantage of it, you'll take advantage of it. And I can put off my master plan for one more round. It's fine. I'll get well, to that later. Can you? <laughs> and somehow it doesn't work out. And oh, no. what happened to that master plan I had yes. two hours ago? Yep. Um, oh, right. I went to get those rupees. And just from that tiny little seed, if I went and got three points worth of rupees, I completely yeah. changed my game. And yes. I didn't know it at the time. I, uh, the, the game, it's just, it's it feels alive. It feels more so than most <laughs> games like, yeah, this is a world that's going to go on living and breathing and doing things, whether we were here or not. And it is because, I think more than anything else, it is because there's that concept of those those actors who move independent of us, that create yes. opportunities if we can time it right and if we can prioritize correctly. And if it weren't for that, I would say, yeah, this game is way too open. 
the sky's the limit. I, I have no idea where to go or what to do. It's too much. But always chasing that merchant, always chasing that builder, always, you know, and having like three, completely three different objective streams you could chase after. That's yep. pretty rare. Most games, oh, here's a couple of objective cards at the beginning of the game. Pick one, discard the other. I guess this is my game now. <laughs> Not Nagra. Not Nagra. We actually built a 3D edifice to all the objectives you can have. Yeah. Um, with the guilds and the palace and all that. So I'm I'm very impressed by that game. And it's gorgeous to boot. Uh, and I'm sure you've played it. I have played it multiple yep. times. Um, yep. Yeah, that was uh, by Michael Keller. And yes. it is interesting that this is your number one. So he, it's Akbar the Great is the one you're talking about. So it's like his Thank 30th you. birthday and the notables are Yes, that's passing. right. Oh, that's everybody's coming to celebrate. Yes. Yeah, that's and why you're a landowner. The river. You're right, just right, a landowner, right. but the notables yeah. are on their way. And so you're yep. trying to get things and, you know, build up paths that maybe you can impress them and up your stance, right? Your status. So that, you know, I, I remember when this came out and everyone was so excited about it. Michael Keller has made some great games and uh, it is huge. Um, it is just a monster of choices that you can yes. make. And yeah. The, it's such a counter to Gingopolis for me because this is a game. <laughs> and, You're right. <laughs> and Michael Keller, so I've, I've spoken to him about this, so I don't okay. feel bad saying this. He right. always has made his games prior to Agra um, as part of a team. So he designs the game and then he had a dedicated developer who would tell him no. That's too much. Okay. Take it out. Take this out. Take this out. I know. I know where you're going with this. Yes. And Michael himself said, "Didn't he? Didn't have his developer on this game?" And he's like, "There was a little too much. There's a little." <laughs> Someone should have said no. Nobody said no. No one ever said <laughs> no. No one said no. And yeah. so I do love Adra, and I love um, definitely the different paths in it. But you have that river that you can take. Yes. And don't take that. No. There's not a it's joke. a trap. It's a trap. It's a trap. Yes, it is a trap. It takes too long. It can, if the game really belabors and goes long, allow you to get to where you need to go. But it is highly unlikely um, <laughs> the way the game works. And so there are all these shinies. And I. That's a great way to put it. Oh, my gosh. That's yes. the perfect way to put it. Because this is, is what kills me in Agra. Shinies at you. Yes. I love shinies, and you can't do that to me. And I met Michael Keller at Essen, and I was like, you just, you're breaking my brain. There's so many shinies. And I'm like, oh, let me grab this. Well, this can't be a bad move. I'm getting so much for it. Oh, I'll do this. And then the game ends, and I've done nothing. I've done nothing but get a bunch of shinies. <laughs> And like moved up a little bit on some random tracks because I had no purpose other than the elephant dropped so many things. I got to go get it. And I'm following yep. him around and like, no, no. And so from the way I game, it, I I do terrible, <laughs> terrible in aggro. You learn more about yourself in that game. You do learn a lot. I mean, in all board games, don't you? Right. You learn about yourself, what your tolerance levels are. And that's what we're talking about in this entire yep. list. Where are your tolerance levels for what you learn about your fellow gamers, for what you learn about yourself, um, for what you're willing to do, how much you're willing to lead other people and how much you're like, no, I don't want to take that on. So every game is like that. And for me, Agra doesn't work because I am the type of gamer who's going to yeah. see all those points, get distracted by them and miss that end goal and You're the right. game ends. And then and I'm that like, is the skill that the yes. game tests more than anything else. Can you ignore distractions? Can you stick yes. to a plan? Yes. Yeah. And that said, so does Ginkopolis, except that it does it in such a way where you're forced to stop and take resources. Okay. You're forced uh -huh. To say, oh, oh, I see. Yeah. The tiles have run out. I better really concentrate on that area control and getting my end game points because there's not going to be a lot of tiles. And this is where, you know, this is my warning bell. Um, Agra has no warning bell. There's no warning bell. It just, <laughs> you just didn't yep. make it down yeah, your path yeah, yeah. far enough. You didn't make it where you needed to go. And now the game's over and you're like, oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Well, you, so it sounds yeah. like you would agree that it is a worthy um, uh, entry for super heavy game then? Uh, entry? <laughs> <laughs> probably that, that, and that's yeah. probably the thing, right? Because we talked about, I do like your gateway um, heavy games because I want to bring more people yeah, into this, this side is, of the this hobby. This is not that. This, this is not, is not that. that. This is no, where no, they're no, going to no, say, no, no. I clearly yeah, this, don't know. <laughs> this is the epitome of what people think of when they think of 
heavy cardboard when it boils right down to it. Yes. Um, and it's interesting, since I asked you, you had written, you had ranked yours by personal preference. You said, yes. hey, these are all heavies that I love. This is my, and I rank them in my favorite. Yes. I went the other way. I ranked them based on heaviness. I will now tell you of my top 10, the one I love the most, yes. ironically, is the, what I would consider the lightest on my list, oh. the number seven, Maracaibo. Okay. And, and I think that is reflective of the fact that at the end of the day, um, there's a reason my show is not called Heavy Cardboard and never would have occurred to me in a million years. We are definitely more <laughs> midweight. We dabble in heavy stuff. But uh, yeah, so yeah, this, that, that's why I kind of was willing to lean on Board Game Geek and their you know, hive mind uh, interpretation of what was heavy or not because mm -hmm. it's all heavy to me, baby. Right. Yeah. And, and, and see, I would counter that with if you look at we've played Maracaibo on Heavy Cardboard. We played Cooper Island on Heavy Cardboard. So Heavy Cardboard is a moniker, but as well, we do a lot of lunchtime streams or thinky sure. filler or yep, yep, yep. really what it comes down to as much as it's called Heavy Cardboard and that's a niche, it's medium to heavyweight. And then we do play lighter games that we think have strategy that we want to explore you know mm -hmm. and i said world's leader in plays of the mind so as much as it's heavy cardboard yes, it exactly. doesn't mean that we only play heavy games so yeah that's interesting that's great uh, folks and that was um jess cassidy the world leader in the mind yes um the <laughs> biggest mind in board gaming and like i said up front if you would like to know more about her because i think we have definitely gotten to know you um I, I, it sounds like you were making some epiphanies yourself during the process of this I got to know myself this in this. <laughs> um, but if you want to know more, if you haven't had enough, go check out the show notes. Uh, you can find her on the social medias as Board Game Girl. And also apparently check out Board Game Dog, which I'm definitely going to be sharing with Jen. <laughs> and um, the Heavy Cardboard channel with her weekly show, A Girl Stampede. And I seem to recall there's a game on Kickstarter for a few more days. Yes. Uh, Petricor, if you'd like to see her work there. Um, that was Jess. And do you have any final words? Thank you so much for having me. This was a blast, and I really appreciate it. I had a great time, too. This was, this was a lot of fun. Fingers crossed it doesn't crash when I hit stop recording now. <laughs> uh, this is the moment of truth. Joy and thanks technology. For watching yes, definitely. Uh, have a nice day, everybody. Talk to you later. So long. Bye. Bye. -bye.